Coming up next, the bookening reads, Farewell to Arms. <laughs> Farewell to Pants. <laughs> Oh man, the sun is beating down. My life is absurd. Put that gun down, Nathan. <laughs> oh man, it's like time is standing still, and the sun, the sun, it's so hot. Nathan, put that, put that gun down. <laughs> oh man, Brandon's swarthy Arabic features annoy me for some you're, reason. You're waving that a little bit. Uh... I guess I'm just glad it's a water gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Brandon, you almost got squirted there. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the booketing. You might have guessed from the intro or from what I just did. We're talking about, what is what is it in French? L'étranger. <laughs> we're talking about la tranche today. The and trash can. That's kind of what it counts, sounds yeah, like. Yeah, la tr trash can. <laughs> And uh, yeah, old Marceau, he uh, shoots that Arab and yeah. nobody knows why. He doesn't even know Least why. Least of all him. Least of all him, yeah. He's a stranger to himself. Oh, is that who the stranger was? And now we've talked about the book. Let's move on to the next, <laughs> okay. the, the next item on the agenda. <laughs> well, folks, this is going to be a very existential episode. The episode doesn't actually have any meaning, I should warn you, but we're going to make our own meaning today. And I'll be helping make that meaning. My name is Nathan. I'm your humble and obedient host. And here in the studio, we have, I don't even remember his name. Does Brandon it matter? Just, no, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. He's just a he's just guy, a, maybe. He's just a he's guy. He's not you. Yeah, he's not me. I don't really feel anything towards him. Am I nothing. even me, though? What Who evidence is? is there? Yeah, exactly. Who is? You are. Who is me? <laughs> uh, he's Brandon Chastain. He's the scholar who's a baller of books. I am. You are, Brent. A very existential fellow. I am. He likes I to sit in my dark room alone, often contemplating the meaningless of existence. Mm, man, yeah. Barely shed a tear when your mother died. Barely. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon's mother is alive and well and wonderful woman. And That's why I have barely shared a tear. Yeah, we shed a tear over yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Brandon, you, there's another existential doom-laden gentleman of, of the absurd here. <laughs> the Sartre to my Camus. The Sartre to your Camus. <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, the, the virulent he is, he is a bit Marxist that su supports gulags and things like this. Uh, a little bit cross-eyed, yes. And suicide. And, and suicide, yes. Well, there's Which no makes you the Simone, Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> hey. <laughs> uh, listen, this, the only philosophical question is suicide. Pretty sure. Exactly right. Isn't that what we learned? That's my in, position. In, That's in the myth of Sisyphus. The, yeah. the myth of Sisyphus. <laughs> Listen, uh, Brandon, uh, I know it's absurd, but would you introduce this guy for us? He's the pastor who's a master of reading. Yeah. Hey, what's Jacob, up? Jacob, Kyle, Mensel, and it's J.K. Mensel. Commander yeah. Daddy. Commander Daddy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beastmaster Funky Town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, here we are. Have you ever said the here word Beastmaster Funky Town so many times that it loses all meaning? <laughs> yeah. You wonder why it does that mean anything? Mm -hmm. let, let me try. I, I did it on yeah. the beach once. Beastmaster Funky Town. Wow. Keep going. I, I don't think I need to. You lost all meaning after one, one recitation. <laughs> did I ever have any meaning is in the first place? Oozing out between the words. Is meaning, what even is meaning? And how do you find it? Oh, that's how true. How can you be certain that you found it if you think you found it? That's true. If, if, ever, if no words have meaning, then how does meaning have meaning? So how do they even know from the beginning what they're talking about? How do we even know what we're talking about? We don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's your t-shirt. There's your t-shirt. How, how, how do we even know what we're talking about? <laughs> we, we don't. don't. <laughs> That's a good t-shirt. <laughs> Put it on the t-shirt list. Uh, t-shirt lister. You know who you are. You know who you are. I'm not going to say who you are. Well, guys. Just say you don't do a crummy job at it. No. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd flush you down the John. <laughs> His name is Flush. All right. <laughs> Guys. Flush do. <laughs> well, this episode's getting off to an appropriately absurd and meaningless start. <laughs> Did you say? Well, it's well-deserved. <laughs> yeah, well-deserved. 
Oh, man. I hope people like hearing us dunk on beloved classics. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they do. If they, they do. It's, they're still here. I mean, what are we, like well, six years in now? Yeah. We dunk we, on the classics that deserve to be dunked on. That's right. There's another Which t-shirt. the ones that we don't like. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't like them for reasons. Right. I think there are people who are concerned about whether or not we're going to dunk on a classic that's coming up. Mm -hmm. And can I just tease it by saying we are not? Yeah. Yeah, we, absolutely. In fact, Ready Player Two, I, we are giving <laughs> full marks to five I, stars. I was a little suspicious at first that it would be a piece of pop culture junk trash. But turns out I put it right up there with Tolstoy like Brandon mm -hmm. tried to do. Yep. Yeah. Ready Player Two. Yeah. Not no. Brandon's yeah. talking about a. I dare say a whale of a tail. <laughs> oh, wow! Very clever. Very clever. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think you're probably the first person to ever make the that. The first joke. person to ever make that joke. Nothing. Do you swear by your tattoo? I swear by my tattoo. Nice. <laughs> oh, always. <laughs> you darn tattoo. <laughs> oh my goodness! By the way, what? You got a new tattoo? I saw, no, yeah, I got a new tattoo. <laughs> oh my goodness, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> thousands of dollars for my back tattoo, guys. <laughs> no, you just, rem by saying the word always, you just reminded me of a uh, movie that I saw recently. Steven Spielberg's Always? Yes, exactly. Is that actually true? No. No. Oh, okay. Well, Steven Spielberg did make a movie named Always that no one cares about. No, I saw a uh, Fantastic Beast colon The Secret oh. Crimes of Grumbledore. Grumbledore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Dawn of Justice. <laughs> Hashtag Dawn of Justice. And they actually used the always. Always. They used always. They brought it back? Like They they, they like called it back. Snape was quoting someone else? N Snape wasn't there because Snape wasn't born yet. Yeah. No, they had this moment where they use always. It's not homoerotic, is it? In this case, it's actually not. Good. You would expect it to be given the fact the whole movie revolves around a homoerotic relationship. But they they she did actually write in always as a as a an emotional beat that couldn't possibly hit home yeah in a really hack way it was the most hack thing she's ever done well, know, just I've, thought i'd throw that out there i've for heard everybody. it's a pretty bad movie it's a it's it's a bad it's a mess of a movie and the only good thing it has going for it is the gay relationship at the center of it and that's how bad it is yikes that's pretty bad yep but that's not what we came to talk about no but we do want to assure people if well, we should also assure them by way of this. You should read it. If you're on the fence about should I read the book about the big whale? The big book that's famous for being boring and discursive and people are wrong. Yeah. And stupid. It, it is the great American novel. I think that's where we're gonna land. Yeah, we point. want people to read it so that you're on board. Yeah. The great booking vessel when we set sail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're in board. You're in board. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, Brandon's urine board. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have a toilet. He just, he, he just has a urine board. He carries it around with him. Yeah. Why a board instead of a bucket? Pocket. I don't know. <laughs> Sets it up. Be careful when he comes over to your house. You have to tell him exactly where to set it up. It's sort of like if you bring a cat over to somebody's house mm -hmm. or whatever, you have to bring like a litter box or something. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why anybody would do that. Yeah. What kind of a <laughs> what kind of word that I can't say? <laughs> brings a cat somebody's to house. somebody's house. But if you're bringing a cat, like if you're going to like board a cat with somebody, like, hey, can you watch yeah. my cat for the weekend? You have to bring the litter box. Brandon brings his urine my board. board. Yeah, mm -hmm. Of course. You have to tell him where to set it up. Mm. I, I recommend outside, far away from the house. Yes. Yeah, it does kind of stink. I remember the, <laughs> I recommend putting the cat outside, far away from the house, somewhere in, like in the Atlantic Ocean. All right. Uh, speaking of cats, let's put this cat discussion on pause. Oh, <laughs> oh, because I hear the sound of guns. Bang, bang. Choo, choo, chain. <laughs> you shot me down. It's gotta be absurd sounds. Come on. Pow, pow. Sounds. All that came out were those two little flags. No. And one that said life is, and the other one says absurd. Absurd. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a cool product. Should that be our yeah. first real piece of booketing merch? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> two guns with flags that say life is absurd. <laughs> Listen, Brendan's the contextual Texan. He brings much needed context to this work. Now, we've been uh, dunking on The Stranger a lot today already because it's just fun to dunk on The Stranger. But we're actually talking about two yeah. existential masterworks. We sure. In the same episode. In the same episode. Oh, so we're going to oh. do... Uh, wow. I thought we were doing two separate episodes. 
We had our, always promised that this would be two episodes, or well, sorry, <laughs> and now we're breaking that promise <laughs> by, stuff, by stuffing them together. <laughs> no, we had our, we had always promised that this would be a double feature because we okay. thought that. Well, I forgot, and I think that's probably fair because I just don't think we're going to get a whole episode out of this stranger. I don't know. I could see getting two pretty big contexts, Brandon. Uh, how do you want to? Well, I think this? that we can do them together. You want to do them together? Yeah, because. Hang on, I'm just verifying my notes here. We need a sound effect for note verification. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they're fairly so they're fairly close in time. <laughs> Actually, be- no, like <laughs> the stranger was. <laughs> I was trying for one of those trains, like the Doppler. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> you, you know when the train goes, but okay, never mind. Sorry, Brandon. It's fine. Go it's ahead. Fine. Brandon's a contextual Texan. He brings much needed context to this work. He's going to give us context on both Camus and Hemingway. I, I am kind of together. We're going to package them as a as a deal here. Mm-hmm. So you're, it's like a two for one. Right. We've yeah, done. I guess you want more context on Hemingway. There are plenty of other places to go. Yeah, we've done an episode on. Uh, we've done episodes on Old Man in the Sea. We've done episodes on the other one that's actually for much more for Farewell to Pants than this one. Yeah, for whom the bell tolls, and that's the one that was actually published two years before The Stranger. Mm. So they're mu- those are much more chronologically close. Huh. They died within a year of each other. Not oh. the books, the men. <laughs> <laughs> if only. If only. <laughs> they died. Uh, Camus died in 1960 in a car accident. Mm-hmm. And, Hemingway, absurd. and Hemingway died in 1961 by refusing to accept mm. Camus' arguments mm. in The Myth of Sisyphus. He decided that suicide was indeed the answer. Mm. So... And his revolt against life was to take the coward's way out, according to Camus. Mm-hmm. Because in The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus argues that, sure, suicide is an answer if you're... A coward. A coward. Yeah, that's the word I can say. you're a wuss, if you can't... A wuss, yeah. Face up to the unbearable weight of existence. Right. And no. you know who could? Camus. Yeah. Until he died in a car accident. But he also did say that it's better to die an absurd way because of life's absurdity than it is to take your own life. Because at least you heroically faced what life could, what the world could bring at you. Woohoo! How do we know that he didn't commit suicide by car? That's a good question. Because he was in the car with his publisher. Yeah. His publisher may have committed murder by car. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm I tired got, of this guy. I got <laughs> to stop this guy from writing anything the, else. rid the world of this So nonsense. actually one of the... The great unsung heroes of history. <laughs> Actually, I was listening to a podcast in preparation for this where there was a French guy on there, the, like a French intellectual that was talking about Camus, and he talked about Camus' death, and he, he had a, his little joke that he thought was very funny, which was, the publisher did what every publisher has dreamed of, but no publisher has ever done until now. And then there was this long pause, and nobody kind of laughed, and then he chuckled, and he said, like, he killed his author. And <laughs> yikes! Wow, it's, it's good stuff. We got a homicidal uh, lecture there. That you're... Well, somebody that's dealt with the world of publishing, I'll tell you that much. I guess I don't Obviously, know. Yeah. That was a little joke. I didn't say it was good. I just thought it was bad, but worth sharing. I think, I think that's great. <laughs> Brandon thinks it's great, though. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They Camus died absurdly. We've learned so far in a car accident. Yeah, and Hemingway and died. I don't know a- if Maxwell Perkins ever wanted to kill Hemingway. I know he often it's wished he could kill train. Fitzgerald. Yeah, Fitzgerald drove him crazy. Fitzgerald also killed himself, essentially. So yeah, he didn't and have to. Maxwell Perkins never killed himself. He died of natural causes. Right. <laughs> so rich, wealthy, unsung at the time. Old yeah, man. there's a great book about him. So Maxwell Perkins was the editor who made all these guys possible. Right. And the book is called Maxwell Perkins, Editor of Genius, I think. Yeah. And, and so... He is the great unsung genius of 20th century letters. We're talking yeah. Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Thomas Wolfe. Those are the three big ones. Yeah, but a handful of others as well. Yep. Um, oh, that... In the same way that Truman Capote is sort of like his own thing, but also maybe responsible for To Kill a Mockingbird. And right. Yeah. And the figure that is there for Hemingway as well as... Maxwell Perkins is Ezra Pound. So both Camus and Ezra, not Ezra Pound, both Camus and Hemingway were influential and disruptive and creative geniuses in their own right. They did things differently. They refused to write stories that were traditional. Instead, they were writing, trying to make it new, like Ezra Pound's mantra was. And so 
Part of this is they were around the same period when everybody wanted to make it new. Everybody was coming out of the 1800s and they were tired either of the language or they were tired of the philosophy. So with Hemingway, that was a response to the Jamesian. Either of you guys read any Henry James? Yeah, I've read exactly the turn of the screw because you have to if you like weird fiction, yeah. but trying to read anything else. <laughs> I've made it halfway through the portrait of a lady very many times. I've, I've made it a hundredth of a way into the portrait of the lady. It's his, 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 his writing style is so dense and annoying and I just yep. I can't stand him. <laughs> And so there was a legitimate turn against this sort of thing. And Ezra Pound and Gertrude Stein, they were trying to change English letters. And this was part of the part of the program of modernism, is that they wanted to really modernize language. They wanted it to sound new. They wanted it to sound like the modern modern English as opposed to this Jamesian dense English. Melville will have more of that dense quality, but he did it much better than he made it interesting, at least. Mm -hmm. He's more like Dickens, another character we're going to talk about. But better than. Better than Dickens. I hands down agree with that. Yes. Thanks. I appreciate you giving me that. <laughs> uh, I was worried you might not. No, 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 no. I'm going to give you that for sure. So anyways, that, that was what they were trying to do. Ernest Hemingway was much more concerned with language. Like that was kind of his project. He wanted to write journalistically, bring this short, sweet, punchy, repetitive style to clarity. and clarity that he had learned from Stein, that he had learned from Pound to English letters. Camus wanted to bring his vision of the world, because he it's it's an interesting question whether or not he was even a philosopher, to his storytelling. And yeah, he was kind of concerned with style, but that was much less his My philosophy class is all taught uh, treated him like a philosopher. I know. That's for sure. I'm not sure that he's a philosopher's philosopher like a a snooty real philosopher wouldn't necessarily say he yeah. a philosopher. Sartre, yeah, but Sartre ended up making fun of him. He's a philosopher that matters because he's the kind he of philosopher that actually... Communicated with people? Yeah, communicated his ideas and had influence and... Yep. And so I think that as we're tracing both of their lives, I, what I would, what I kind of wanted to stress today are these thematically two things they share in common. One, the unrest that's happening in the early 1900s revolting against the Victorian and conservative values of the 1800s. And we've talked a lot about why this was the case in past episodes. Part of it was World War I. Everybody was just over the vision of the world, that science could progress us and that the world was getting better and better all the time. People just saw that that wasn't the case. And so radical political revolution needed to happen. Camus would be more on that side. He does get very involved with communism and things like that even though he would become a little bit disenchanted with that later on in his life, and that would cause a, a rift between him and Sartre, or Sartre, however we want to say his name. Melville was also kind of involved with that. I mean, famously, he had the FBI put him on their, or the CIA put him on their watch list and drive boats around Cuba. Melville? Not Melville, sorry. <laughs> I have, Amazing. I, That's like the famous time, time story travel. of the Hemingway, FBI. Hemingway. <laughs> People are going to, probably going to slip a lot because guy. there's a book. I'd really rather be talking about Moby Dick, but I can't be. Yeah. So we're going to um, do an awesome episode on Moby Dick. We got to talk yeah. about. We got to. This is like, yeah. this is like the uh, the exercises you have to do before you can go into an amazing cave. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You guys feel me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, what was I talking about with these guys? Uh, World War One. Yeah, and then World War Two just makes that worse, even though. Both of these books we're looking at today predate World War II, so we're not really going to talk much about that. But World War I was awful. It, was, it, it, it just changed all of the Western psyche was traumatized by World War I. You have guys on horses being like, yay, we're fighting another Napoleonic-style war, yeah. and then getting mowed down by machine machinery. Guns. Exactly. So what you saw is that the, 18, the way that people saw the world in the 1800s was now facing the reality of what the 1800s had created with the industrial and scientific revolutions. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought it was making the world better. And actually all it did was kill everybody. <laughs> and so you were faced in what Camus points out in the myth of Sisyphus is that one of the first places we begin to understand the absurdity of existence is when we realize we're going to die. And World War I was a very austere reality for people that you're going to die. And the stuff that you th are doing that you think is going to prevent death is actually the thing that your enemy is going to use to kill you. <laughs> and so, and kill you in very horrible ways. So, 
that was the world that both of these guys were living and writing in. So you had just the political realities that were happening. You had the unrest of the intellectuals, all these things coalescing in what these guys did with their art. Very different upbringings. Camus was born in colonial France and Algeria. His, uh, he was born into a working class family. And even though because of his intelligence, he got to go to schools that, so the French school, schooling system is, is merit-based, right? You, you earn your position in certain things. You earn your ability to go to university and all this stuff. And so he got to do those things, but still he came from the working class and this would, his father died in World War I when he was young. So he was born, when was he born? He was, he died in 1960, so he must have been born like what, 19... Camus born. I got it right here. 1913. 1913. So his, his dad, his father died in World War I. So he was very young when his dad died. Mm. And so he was raised by his mom and also his grandmother, who was very strict and just not a pleasant figure in his upbringing. But he was around poor working class people his entire life. And so later on in his philosophy, he talked about poverty and light. Can I, can I read the quote? Yeah. This is a pretty famous quote. Poverty, first of all, was never a misfortune for me. It was radiant with sunlight. I owe it to my family, first of all, who lacked everything and who envied practically nothing. Yeah. And so this led him to really appreciate poverty and appreciate the hardworking ethic of poor people that it made them more connected to each other, made them more connected to the production of their hands. It's no surprise that he would become sympathetic to socialism and communism later in his life. And so he was very much entrenched in that sort of thing. And then also Algeria apparently is for the French, like this place of imagine, they, they imagine it as this kind of a vacation sensual spot, dancing and pleasure and food and beaches. And so he grew up around that as well. And so he had this, the health of the ocean, the health of where he grew up and also mm -hmm. the health of poverty. And this really influences his later life. You have another quote? Well, yeah, yeah. I grew up with the sea and poverty for me was sumptuous. Then I lost the sea and found all luxuries gray and poverty unbearable. Yep. So there you go. And so it was kind of trying to get back to those things that it um, epitomizes his literature and philosophy. I mean, The Stranger is set in Algeria. So, so that was his upbringing. Hemingway had a very different upbringing. His father was a doctor. His mother was a musician. They had deep roots in like, which war was it? The, the civil war, like his grandfather was a, an important figure in that. And yeah. so they were a prominent figure in Chicago. He got to go to Michigan and hunt and fish. He went to good schools. He was kind of an athlete in school, but it was more. So what Hemingway was really good at was myth making. And he made himself into a myth by, so what Hemingway did is eventually after he graduates, he decides he wants to become a man of letters. He, he, he gets a job with the Chicago Sun through his uncle, finds out he likes to write. He's a, he's a good writer, and he likes this new journalistic style. It's short, it's punchy, and it's to the point. He becomes friends with Ezra Pound, who's also kind of trying to do the same thing, you know, make it new with his imagism and his vorticism, all these things. Their real goal is to just look at the thing itself with letters, which means you got to cut out all the fat and excess. Gertrude Stein's over in France. She's doing kind of the same thing. So he decides to move over to France, becomes part of the um, lost generation. The expatriates goes off to bullfights, gets involved with some of the people from the Algonquin table and right. Mm -hmm. And those characters come over like the starlets that are coming up in cinema. So all this is around the same time with Hemingway. And, you know, they go out and they party and they have sex with everybody. And it's just a big, fun, debauched time. Midnight in Paris happens around that. Midnight in Paris. Owen Wilson goes back in time. Yep. Yeah, if you've exactly. seen that, that's a good, it's actually a really good movie to show you kind of what their life was like. Yeah. And the only way you it's could a, do it's this. It's a good placeholder, yeah. actually. Yeah. The only way, the only way he could do this is he had daddy's money, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these, Fitzgerald went to Princeton. He had daddy's money. A lot of these writers had daddy's money behind them. And that's how they got to become the writers that they became. And that's mm. really, really is really important to understand about like modernism. Like T.S. Eliot also came from a very prominent family, mm -hmm. a fairly prominent family. And so, yeah, they had to work to make ends meet, but they also just had money that allowed them to just have the free time to do this. Like isn't to it Chesterton? To their own tortured existence. Exactly. It's Chesterton who made the point that people who are working class never have the time to have adultery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it's kind of the same way here. They just had all this free time in the, in the world. And so they could do whatever they wanted. And 
it kind of makes you realize that it's there's a little bit of patheticness to under all this. But yeah. anyways, out of that comes the sun also rises. His relationship to Maxwell Perkins through Fitzgerald. He meets all these other characters and he begins to craft what we know today as Hemingway's style. He also, through publishing these books, begins to craft who we know as the masculine Hemingway because it's kind of a self-made myth. Yeah, he boxed and he drank and he did all these things, but never quite as much as the male figures in his books try to make it seem. And so that's, that's something I want to keep in mind as we talk about this, a farewell to arms, because mm -hmm. he does go and fight in the war. He was born in 1899. He was old enough to go and fight in World War I, but he couldn't, his vision was really poor. And so he was put into the ambulance. And so he was an ambulance driver. And yeah, he saw some horrible things. I recently, for the first time, saw Band of Brothers, and one of the best episodes is on the medic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the medics, they, you see horrible things, right? And so, you don't want to downplay that. And he did get wounded by a mortar shell follow, falling. But Hemingway, Hemingway's an interesting character. There's always this mix of jealousy and egoism with him mm -hmm. that's really hard to parse through. And the more Hemingway I read, the more I think that he just really was in the business of making himself out to be this masculine American fallen hero that his life didn't completely go along with. He wanted to be the wounded soldier mm -hmm. and the sun also rises. He wanted to be the wounded soldier in a farewell to arms, but he was the ambulance driver. Right. <laughs> and so he got hit by the mortar and he did go to a, a hospital and he did fall in love with his nurse. It was unrequited, but he did fall in love with her. And that is the basis for a, a farewell to arms. And so that's really what you need to know about Hemingway to get us there. And he was beginning. <clears throat> and so after that, his career takes off. He gets a sun. The sun also rises, gets published in oh, what year? It's 1926. Hmm. And Farewell to Arms is right after that in 1929. So it's one of his early books. And both of these are extremely autobiographical. In fact, the sun also rises first had pretty much all the names of the friends he had experienced these things with. Which is just nasty, by the way. I mean, I know you write what you know and you take from life and no great author doesn't pilfer from the people that he knows. And I'm sure Jane Austen's friends and family could point to people that she was parodying. But the, the amount of vitriol that he's spilling towards people that would have been easily identifiable at the time to each other mm -hmm. in Sun Also Rises, I'm thinking particularly of the main woman character, I forget her name, Lady something or other. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it makes for a pretty sour book when you think of it that way. It's pretty, it's pretty mean. It is. <laughs> and Hemingway could be pretty mean. And, but he became very famous, very fast. What he saw was that he could take the stuff that Pound and Stein were trying to do, because Stein was one of his patrons, and he could make it commercially viable. Because he could put enough war and sex and stuff in his books that the layman would also want to read it. But also the critic would look at it and say, oh, I see what he's doing with language. So like Maxwell Perkins could get really excited about it. But then so could just the regular working class Joe coming in off the street. And so he, he, and he did. He became very famous. People loved his vision of the debauchery of the lost generation. And, uh, and so, yeah, they're all the famous things to keep in mind. He went to the soirees of Gertrude Stein, became part of her living room social group, and they all helped each other criticize their work and find publishers like it's through Fitzgerald that he met there, that he found Maxwell Perkins who helped uh, launch his career. But it really, it's just really important to understand both, I think, the reality of how they went about getting that existence. If you have you either you read ever a movable feast, some of it, not all of it. Like you just wonder how does he f have the time to just write these things? Like did you, short stories got you some money, mm -hmm. but not enough to just live. And he lived in Paris for a, a while with his wife, and he would go out and he would buy a bottle of wine and all these dinners, and he would go out and have long car rides with Fitzgerald to the countryside. And just had time to write. And that was his existence. He didn't have to work. He would wake up in the morning and go boxing. And just, that, that was who he was. That was how, his, how much of that debauchery do you think was exaggerated? Or I, I, think, I don't think the sin element was exaggerated, but he, I think he probably wanted to make it sound like that was more of his actual existence. Yeah. And also, it's, I mean, he's getting to focus on particular days. You always forget the days that were in between. Right. And so, those were, those were things that happened, but a lot of it was just more just mundane 
regular day. Right. But that's Hemingway. And I mean, there's the whole story about what happens with his later life. But really, this is what this is the lead up to get us to this book. And it's pretty much all you really need to know to get us to this book. That's the author who was behind it. And so the other things is like, how is he then involved with some of the ideas? Hemingway, so modernism was taking place. T.S. Eliot was much more involved with the ideas and the philosophy of modernism with his poetry. And it's those ideas that kind of intersect with what Camus does. So the ideas of modernism were this revolt through Ezra Pound. So Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot really were kind of the, the philosophizers of it. That revolution, that idea of making it new, that was Pound. And T.S. Eliot took that up. And Hemingway saw his opportunity. I think that Hemingway was just a really good marketer, too, of himself. Mm -hmm. And he saw, he saw and this opera, he had stylistic genius. I mean, he changed American writing. But he saw the opportunity, and here was a philosophy he could get behind. The other big thing that goes hand in hand with Camus is this disenchantment. And it's a disenchantment with the past. It's a disenchantment with the present. It's, it's just the understanding that the typical categories that the West has used to try and make meaning of the world no longer work. And that's what T.S. Eliot tried to represent through the wasteland. That what we are on now because of World War One is this shore is where we just have the ruin of our culture. And we're just picking through the fragments, hoping to make some meaning out of it all. For the modernists, the answer was art. You make meaning through art. All this does stretch back to Nietzsche in the 1800s and even before him. So you had Kierkegaard and Nietzsche who were both kind of the fathers of this new philo philosophical movement that with Sartre especially would become known as existentialism. But what these people were, what these philosophers were trying to come to terms with was the fact that reality, the world, doesn't lend itself to meaning. We try to put meaning onto the world, but it's not like, so with Plato and Aristotle, they were what you would call an essentialist philosophy. They believed that truth preexisted the universe and that we can use the universe to come to understand truth but that essence and all those things pre-exist who we are as, as substance and as earthly realities. The existentialists said, no, that truth doesn't pre-exist. It's not there. We wish it was. And it's this tension, this, this friction between the human desire to have meaning, the human desire to have happiness, and the reality that the world has no meaning, that is what Camus means by absurd. That's absurdity for him. Our existence is absurd. Because um, Sartre would call it what we're condemned to be free, meaning that you're born into this world, you don't get a choice, and then you get to choose what system of meaning you decide to participate in to give meaning to the world. And this stretches back to, like I said, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, who are both seen as kind of the fathers of this philosophy. Nietzsche famously just saying any system of meaning is meaningless except for the will to power, that the powerful man is the one who forces his vision of reality onto the world and therefore onto others, preferably through art. Wagner was his great hero until they had a falling out. <clears throat> and then, of course, the Nazis would take up his philosophy as well and saying that Hitler was the great Übermensch. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kierkegaard, have you guys, have you read much Kierkegaard? Yeah. So his response, of course, he was a Christian existentialist, mm -hmm. was the leap of faith. The night of infinite resignation. Yeah. The fact that, yes, this world would be meaningless were we just left to our own devices, but God has put meaning into it and that you have to have faith in that meaning. Faith itself is absurd. Yeah. But if you are willing to take that leap of faith and you find a kind of <laughs> meaning and you just sort of jump into the circular yeah. logic of it all and embrace it. And which when you understand Kierkegaard and what he was writing against and Kierkegaard, he gets misused by sort of the cheesy reformed philosophy today, but he had a lot of really great points he was making. And so I think Kierkegaard's worth reading. I don't know what you say to that, Jake, but. I feel about Kierkegaard in some ways, the, the way that I feel about Dostoevsky and the way that I feel about a certain kind of self-tortured pastor, philosopher, theologian. The reality of Kierkegaard's life is that he had everything and he was going to become a pastor and he had a woman that he loved. 
and he had and did you not know this about no. him? Well, he was going to become a pastor, and he had a woman that I've he, never actually studied Kierkegaard other than just some quotes. He was going to become a pastor. He had a woman that he loved and that he was going to marry. And then he had a, a crisis of what he thought was a crisis of meaning and purpose and what I think was a crisis of responsibility. That led him to take the heroic high road of ditching the girl and <laughs> ditching the ministry and being a critic of all things Christendom and church and ah. everything else and feeling like he had, he had done the hard thing that nobody else could do. Which was give up a family, when give, up, was just scared give of a girl. up a girl, give up give up ministry in a corrupt institution, <sighs> and 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 done the the noble work of becoming a a philosopher and critic of the system. Mm. I mean, you yeah. can't blame a guy. Girls are scary. Girls are, Girls scary. are scary. Responsibility <laughs> sucks. <laughs> so I I always filter a lot of Kierkegaard through that lens, and it's not that his criticism is bad. He's a really good critic, but I also think he's just a wuss. That's helpful. At the end of the day. Interesting, um, and, and and a lot of people who who really take to Kierkegaard or model themselves after him or like him a lot, you see the same sorts of, of tendencies in a lot of those people, and it's all of a piece in my mind. And it's uh, sort of the kind of faux heroicism that comes uh, with the internet warrior who uh, can't get a girl or is too terrified to be a dad. So I I, I just. That's my take on Kierkegaard. And, uh, I see why you group him with Dostoevsky. Yeah. <laughs> well, that might be the well, most helpful thing you're going to hear on this podcast today, people. I took several classes with a Kierkegaard and Nietzsche expert named Paul Eisenberg at IU. Yeah. And I, Eisenberg is a genius and sort of on the been on the forefront with a couple other names like Walter Kaufman. In, we read Walter Kaufman's book in my uh, Intro to Philosophy. Right. So the class was, the key class for me was existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre. And so Eisenberg pronounces Sartre, Sartre, and he pronounces Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard. And if you hear me pronounce it that way, it's because I had a professor. Someone who knew nothing we were talking about. Who knew what he was talking so about. So let's say it that really way. It's just Sartre, right? Sartre. And let's just say Sartre then. That's how he said it. Sartre. Um, <laughs> it's a brilliant dude. But, but yeah, and, but you would get into, we would get into you know, he wasn't afraid to not just get into the text, but beyond the text with with those guys. Jake, and, aren't you reading too much of their life into their philosophy? You know, I tend to believe, as did Professor Eisenberg, and as do, I think, most smart people, that life and philosophy are sort of intertwined and inform each what? other. And you can get a pretty good perspective on somebody's philosophy by examining it through the lens of their life. You mean one of the important tenets of the bookending is right? I, I kind of think so. <laughs> one yeah. of them. Well, yeah. <laughs> The rest of them are, you know, purely arbitrary, but that one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's anyhow, that's, uh, the that's, way I, that's the way I take uh, Kierkegaard. So it's... Well, it's because of existentialism that you get the whole silly, the author is dead thing anyways. And that's one of the big... Funny, right. All those French intellectuals are part of the same movement. It's really funny that conservatives today have picked up on that particular literary critique. Because right. Because it's and, such a liberal <laughs> idea. Well, yeah. and these guys, I mean, they... they I mean... It really is true, and it and it's not like Paul Johnson is unfair in a lot of places, and I've not actually spent a lot of time reading him because of that, because he likes, I think he mischaracterizes a lot, of, and so do a lot of people who try to come at this issue. But the reality is, on the whole, he's right. Like, these guys were debauched, and they were trying to justify their fruitless, useless, meaningless, highly privileged lives. And if they had grown up and got out and got some sunshine and gotten married and been faithful to their wives and done honest work, they would have been healthier and happier and a lot less <laughs> detrimental to society. So Kierkegaard is sort of a special case because he did end up offering so many useful criticisms. But also, I don't know, dude, just like marry the girl and have faith and be useful to real people in your life, like become the pastor that you were supposed to become. I don't take it for guy. granted that he wouldn't have been just as brilliant on the world stage if he had done those things. I think he no, may I think well have been, been more. more. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of, it's the Calvin conundrum, right? Like Calvin was committed to going and in, in writing and becoming a top tier 
academic, a scholar of the Reformation, and he was confronted by William Farrell, who said, damn you and your books to hell. If you do that, you got to come to Geneva and be a pastor. And would we have, would Calvin have have changed and shaped the world the way that he did if he had not done that first? Uh, mm-hmm. The answer is no, no way. Calvin, the pastor, is the Calvin that sh- that changed and reshaped the world. And I think that if Kierkegaard would have just manned up, he might have been that much more influential and helpful hmm. in a more positive way instead of sort of being the low-key precursor to Nietzsche. Yeah. And you recommended him, Brandon. Man, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, where do we go from there? Back to absurdism? Back to absurdity. <clears throat> Okay, so nothing you, that Jake said actually had any meaning, based uh, on any yeah, real. No. You don't even know if it's true. I could have just made it up. So, right? so with it that convenient, with that philosophy as background, just so you, so people know, it's what Camus and Sartre were working with was nothing new. They they were just rehashing some old ideas and then putting it into the context of this new disenchantment with reality after World War One and saying, "Yeah, look what happened. They were right. Life is absurd." And it's in this context that Camus would write The Stranger, which I think was his first, let's see, his first book, right? Yes. Well, you had a happy death that he, but was, wasn't published until later. His first popular book, at least. Yeah. So, The Stranger, and it was not published until 1942. So, this is a decade after and well into the career of Hemingway. But it's all these ideas that had been festering. And so, during this period, Camus had begun to get some acclaim as um, sort of a radical journalist. He was involved with radical ideas. He was anti-colonial France. And so, he was beginning to take very leftist political stances and be known for his position. And this would eventually actually lead to part of the reason he would get the Nobel Prize, because it wasn't just for his literature, but also for his humanitarian efforts. And it was during this period they became friends with Sartre. And began to become involved with what would be known as existentialism. Sartre would be much more of the philosopher and would be much more of of the one who would lay out the tenets of existentialism, which essentially is that we're, as humans, we want to put meaning onto a world that is meaningless. And it's when we realize the meaninglessness of the world that we're finally at first free because we realize that everything we do only has purpose because we choose to do it, right? And so, you can create basically your own version of reality. That's a, that's a simplification of what his argument is, but that's the basic idea of existentialism. And they both then have arguments as to why this doesn't lead you to moral relativism. Then that's pretty much their, was their philosophical career, was trying to show you why existentialism actually frees you to be moral, Mm-hmm. That's what Sartre spent almost his entire philosophical career trying to do. I think he truly failed. Truly moral. Yeah. Truly moral. I think he failed, but that was what he tried to do. Camus, I have more sympathy towards because one of his background, and I do think that he had real concern for the condition of people in Algeria, for the way that he had grown up. I think it's natural that he would end up in sort of the revolutionary theater, which is where he was for a time, and then also revolutionary journalism and all these things that made names for himself, right? But he didn't end up al- aligning himself, at least as much as his critics wanted him to, with the Marxism. No, he didn't. In fact, he would eventually reject it, which would lead to a, f- a falling out with him and Sartre, among other reasons, because Sartre wanted to sympathize with Stalin and the communist movement. Sartre Sartre is on record saying horrible things in favor of the gulags. I mean, just saying, okay, maybe the gulags are bad, but so are the bourgeoisie and what are you going to do? Like, Yeah, exactly. Because Camus was anti-violence and Sartre thought that violence could be used as a means to an end. Right. And so, this led to a falling out between them. Now, this doesn't mean that Camus was a great guy. Camus famously had his love triangle between him and Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and had some ethical things that were problematic for him as well. So, yeah. But if you're looking and examining the two men, I think that you're going to be much more sympathetic to Camus than Sartre in the end. 
Kimu at least has the self-awareness to feel bad about where his tenants lead him, leave him in cert- certain places. I mean, yeah. the, the Fall is an interesting book. What is it? Like the judge walks by a girl that throws herself in the river and drowns and, yep. and then sees that he's been a man that's made himself moral. But actually, when push came to shove, when his value system was put on trial, it failed. He did not do the one thing that he should have done to prove that anything that he said ever meant anything. Yep. And so, where Sartre is like, yes, actually, revolution can lead somewhere. Camus actually just kind of like, well, I don't know, guys. I don't know when push comes to shove, whether any of us are worth anything, which is a depressing position and a false one, but yeah. also a, a more honest one. And it's also that Camus, when he was the most successful, was writing his philosophy through art as opposed to just these philosophical writings. So, uh, which is what Sartre would do. I mean, he did write The Myth of Sisyphus and that book came, actually came out right after The Stranger. So, his two most famous works were kind of back to back. The Stranger was the fictionalized account of what he would then argue with The Myth of Sisyphus. And in The Myth of Sisyphus, what he does is he takes his myth of the god who has to, who's condemned to push the stone up and down the hill. He pushes the stone up and then it rolls back. Then he pushes the stone up and then it rolls back. And he's like, this is a good picture for what our life is, just meaningless and repetitive. And why in the face of this is suicide not the right answer? What makes life meaningful? And his eventual answer is that because it's a wussy way out, that the right answer is to revolt against this this unfairness of life and do your best to give your own meaning and your own purpose to existence that doesn't want to give it to you, that will not give it to you because it's not there. And that's his answer. Whether or not the stranger actually successfully represents this answer, I don't know, because it certainly doesn't seem to give you that as an answer. (laughs) (laughs) Really what the stranger seems to do at best is just try and prove to you the absurdity part of the argument. But I guess as far as getting into the books, and I already mentioned this, his view of the absurd that we see here is sort of this blinding reality, which when the sun falls on the God and all this stuff, and then people make meaning out of that with the court case at the end. But it's not actually what happened. All that happened is this, he was hot and it just kind of, he saw the glint and he fired and it was almost just instinctual, right? But everybody wants there to be meaning on this event that will, is just meaningless. And so that's kind of how he represents that in the book. And then you're left with the question, is the main character responsible or not for the murder that happens? But it's that tension between our desire to have meaning and the world's refusal to give us meaning is what uh, Camus meant by absurdity. And his answer, again, is that there is a moral responsibility towards others. There is a moral responsibility towards being an ethical actor. But whether or not he actually successfully ever proves that is another question. But he definitely thinks that the answer is not just like Nietzsche to just go out and do whatever you want. And you see that in some of his later works as well. And even though, I mean, there would have been no way that they would have known each other, even though there would have been no way that they would have known of each other, Hemingway kind of has some of the same answers in his books, right? He has, or at least he deals with some of the same questions. Where does the meaning of life come from in the face of war and love and the fact that we know that those we love are going to die? And that's kind of the same question that A Farewell to Arms, that is the question A Farewell to Arms deals with, right? Mm -hmm. It actually has a similarly senseless act of violence at its very center when the yeah. hero just guns down the the guy that's running from the i mean it, it kind of makes sense i guess but it's pretty senseless the way that hemingway portrays it at least yeah but anyways I, th- I think that's pretty much what i wanted to stress with context was get those similarities out there and differences between the guys so. Do you think that you said they wouldn't have known each other obviously but i'm just wondering how uh, Camus does such a good job of popularizing this philosophy through writing an incredibly sexy book with The Stranger, by which I mean it's just got a very noir kind of Hollywood sense of cool. It's it's very Hemingway-esque, for lack of a better word. It's, it's at least in the way of the translation that's come down to us, the modern translation. It's very punchy. It's very funny. It's very... Yeah, I mean, mama died today is yeah. the way it opens up. So, it is very short and snippy kind of like Hemingway and I I think that that's because they were in the same artistic they were both avant-garde right and so they would have both been influenced by this new way of writing I mean Hemingway came to his understanding of art in France so it's not like this was an English way of understanding what Mm -hmm. style needed to be the French were doing the same thing right because it was happening in Paris and so 
they would have had some of the same avenues of where they would have learned their style. He was part of the avant-garde theater. Jacques Cousteau, or, or whatever his name is, was one of the big influencers on Albert Camus. And Jacques Cousteau, I think it was. Yeah, Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau, the great yeah. oceanographer. Yep. And he was also, he was a journal, he was involved with journalists. I mean, in the sense, I think it was like the avant-garde journals, but either way, mm -hmm. he was also trying to write in a way that Hemingway was as well. Right. With journalism was. It, so I think that they would have had some similar avenues in the way that they learned to write and what they were trying to do with their art to just be simple and straightforward so that we could understand the truth through their style. Yeah. And also disaffected and cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that that would be one of the reasons. And who knows? I mean, I don't know. Did Camus ever read Hemingway? That's an interesting question. Did Camus? <laughs> <laughs> Google will tell us. Yeah. Ask Jeeves. Apparently it's a question people have asked. It comes up. I think it's an obvious question. I assume the answer is yes, because I assume Camus was plugged into what was happening at his time and Hemingway was a big enough part of that. Apparently the critic Jean Paulhan said Camus is like Kafka written by Hemingway. That's, that's great. Yeah. I love that's that. That's pretty good. There's an article that talks about the similarities between the two, but apparently that's not just something that is readily available. But definitely people realize that they are very similar. They both won the Nobel Prize for Literature within the six years of each other. If Hemingway wrote The Metamorphosis, it would be like, Gregor was a cockroach that day. He went outside and smoked a cigarette. Then he had sex with a lady. It was kind of fun. But not that fun. She was really into him, but he wasn't that into her. Yeah. But he liked her for the sex when he felt like having sex. She was kind of annoying, but she also kind of represented something big or something. But so does Absinthe. Yeah. It was weird being a cockroach. <laughs> he lit another cigarette. See here. <laughs> <sighs> the influence Hemingway had on Camus was not, of course, ideological. <laughs> that was Sorry. the best thing that's ever happened on the book. That game. was the best thing that's... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I just completely missed it. Sorry. Oh, but I, I think Camus did learn from Hemingway how to organize his philosophy dramatically. Camus saw in Hemingway's fiction the possible means to dramatize ideological that's, that's, beliefs, the techniques to objectify that's what you that's what you yeah. character emotions and sentiments and stylistic <clears throat> devices to reinforce you, you, and supplement the worldview of Which is a hoity way of saying. Camus on one side and Camus having the wherewithal to look at somebody like Hemingway and say, oh. Maybe I should do that popular thing. Yeah, if I want to be like influential and stuff and actually communicate my ideas, I should do the thing that would do that. Yeah. Did either one of you guys watch the Hemingway Ken Burns documentary? No, no. but I know that you did. Yeah, I talk about it all the time. You do talk about it all the uh, time. If you like slow zoom ins on pictures of Hemingway, then Is it good? man, what a documentary. I thought it was good. I thought it was interesting to watch Ken Burns wrestle with Hemingway's legacy. Like it's it was like kind of four hours long though, right? It is four hours long. My baby was newly born and I was up in the middle of the night and it just gave me something to do while she was fussing. So that was the only reason I actually made it through it. But it was, it was interesting. Like they had this black guy and anytime Emmy was, Hey, was being a racist. Oh, there's the black interviewee who shows that they like, he never comes out any other time, but they'd bring him out for that. So. It was kind of fun to watch a modern person that obviously really likes Hemingway wrestle with his legacy and, and kind of fail. But one thing that they do in order to wrestle with Hemingway, they want to make space for his macho posturing. And so they emphasize all the ways that he was effeminate, all the ways that he was broken sexually. And that part was interesting. I mean, the big thing that I learned was that his Hemingway's, Hemingway's domineering mother wanted twins but didn't get them. And so Ernest, who was 18 years, or I'm sorry, 18 months apart from his sister, was often dressed like a girl. And Ernest's sister was often dressed like a man. And you can find pictures of them dressed identically or dressed androgynously. They slept in tw tw twin cribs. They were given the same dolls to, huh. to play with. And yeah, he, Ernest has like a lot of weird sexual brokenness, even more than you might expect and then they emphasized all the hints and clues and letters and things that actually talked about Hemingway's sex life and how empty and pathetic it was I won't go into the details but the, the kind of things that he would need to achieve uh, pleasure were just 
the kinds of neat things that a very sad, broken, sexually unsatisfied person would be, would, would, which, which I suppose isn't any kind of a surprise, but it was just interesting to see that we have such evidence of the, the absolute forlorn emptiness of this mas- macho posturing. Like, even in his early life, he wasn't getting any real pleasure out of it. What's that sound? Oh, man, it's the baggage plane. That's right. It's the plane that carries baggage. Just like airports are, you know how we're, you're at an airport and you're like, there goes the baggage plane. Yeah, well, famously, what we do is we fly and then they send a separate airplane with all of our baggage and that's why. Yeah, I'm putting my daddy issues on that plane alone. It's like it almost crashes. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> Listen, guys, it's the baggage plane indicating that we need to talk about our baggage. Jake, what baggage did you bring? To Camus, I guess you've already said some of your baggage for Camus. Yeah, I mean, my baggage for Camus is college philosophy and existentialism courses, specifically with Professor Eisenberg. And Mm -hmm. so I've already sort of touched on that sort of thing. I have a, I would say that a large part of my coming to faith uh, story is very sort of Ecclesiastes, existentialist. So I there was a time when I was threatened with drowning in the cesspool of existentialist mm. thought. And that's about the time I was reading all these guys. And so I have that kind of baggage where I just have a sort of disdain and disgust. I see it as immature. I associate it with 18 to 20, 18 to 21 which yeah, one of the reasons we're so hard on this is because we're all to one degree or another repenting of it. So. That's right. So, so that when it comes to Camus, that's how I, I mean, I'm just sort of, I don't have a lot of patience for this stuff anymore. I don't think it's deep. I don't think it's profound. I think it's, but why did Marceau shoot the guy? We'll never know. I, th- I think it's <laughs> decadent young man. It's like time had stopped. The sun was beating down. Faux intellectual garbage for people with too much time on their hands. Whoa. Um, yeah. And so that's how I think that's the baggage I bring to Camus. Shot fired. And yeah. He did not. I uh, <laughs> think there's not an Arab in here. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't change my mind one bit with this reading. Mm-hmm. It was exactly what I thought it was. Had you let, read The Stranger read before? I had. I'd read The Stranger. I've read most everything that I feel like most everything that Brandon's referenced, myth, myth, myth of Sisyphus. I've read a ton of Nietzsche and a ton of Kierkegaard. And yeah. So. Anyhow, that's my Camus existentialist sort of baggage on that side. And that, that was all just like a part of my religious studies degree. But with Hemingway, I don't have near as much direct or directly associated baggage. Really just, you know, what we have read on this podcast and maybe some short stories and things off, you know, like Hills with White Elephants and... Hills with white elephants. Is hills it? with white elephants. The hills are alive with white elephants. The hills are alive. Yep. The hills like white elephants. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure. But yeah, so I've read what the old man in the sea and for whom the bell tolls. He touches the pine needles. Yep. And yep. 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 Maybe something else, but I don't think so. So not near as much because my educational background on modernism and the. F- it has always been more on the directly philosophical side that was just rather than the letters the literature side rather so I feel like yin to yin to whatever that thing is you're a yin to Brandon's yang <laughs> yeah I guess what you're a yin, yin to my yang oh, wait is it yin and yang yeah uh-huh. you're y- a quid y- to yin, Brandon's yin yin yang yin yang yeah there's no there is yin, a yang there's no yin, yin. Yen. Yen's like dollars. Yeah. Yen. Yen. You're racist. Yen. Dog. Got me. You probably want to shoot Arabs for no reason. Probably. Uh, anything else? Jake and I are the Yin Yang twins. Yeah. yeah. Beastmaster Funky Town and Ghost Brandon, the Yin Yang twins. <laughs> Drop a beat, Nathan. <laughs> it was really hot when I was caught by my desire to shoot an Arab. Take it, Jake. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody pull that. <laughs> Sample it. <laughs> Go ahead, Yi, if you're listening. You think Yi listens to this podcast? I think Yi does, yeah. Are we the Yang to his Yi? Yeah. Uh, Brent, old, old also listens to it, Yi Old. Yi Old. 
I don't think Coffee Shop ever listens, though. <laughs> oh, Nathan. Uh, Brandon, what's your baggage? <laughs> oh, boy, my baggage. That was the time you shot the Arab. That was that time. My baggage with Camus is very similar to Jake's. Read him in a philosophy class. Then read him in a French class. I've read him in the actual French. Ooh la la. Ooh, la, la. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Along with Le Petit Prince. Mm, the Little Prince. Yeah. Um, an episode that you somehow contrived to not be on, <laughs> my, my fair fangled friend. It sounds a, a lot class. more interesting than me reading Kafka in German. Yes. <laughs> it was. I had one of those classes. Well, you know, the Little Prince is like, you should commit suicide. And then it's a good thing you read Camus because he's like, eh. Coward. Maybe not. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> little Prince. <laughs> I don't know why, but don't. <laughs> I think Camus would probably agree that... The little prince should commit suicide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He could take the coward's way out. <laughs> One of the podcasts I was listening to said, we, you know, if you have a friend who is struggling with suicide, you want to give him the myth of Sisyphus. And then one of them says, well, isn't that the kind of friend that like calls you all the time? And then eventually, you know, it gets annoying and you just want to be like, okay, yeah, I just, I confirm you and your decision. Maybe it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a really edifying podcast. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, my baggage. Yeah. So yeah, I went through my 18 to 20 year old funk where I thought it was cool to be an existentialist and wanted to be an existentialist and watched all the existential movies and read all the existential books. And so who doesn't? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Who doesn't go through that? Mm. So, and now I'm on. No one in this room does not go through that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm on the far side of that. And I'm like, that's a place I don't want to go back to. Yeah. The far side's full of like cows that talk. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Random. I'm talking about absurdism. I think School I would rather live in the far side universe than Albert Camus' universe. <sighs> are they any different, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> far side's funny. I think and so. Yeah. That's, I'm, I'm with Jake there. What about Hemingway? Just, I really have no more time for Camus. And so there are books. So just to go back and I probably will make, I should probably, I could wait to make this point, but there are books that I'm not upset. I read, mm -hmm. I think stranger falls into that category. There are books that I'm not upset. I read, but also would never want to read again. The stranger falls into that core category. There are books that I've also fall into those three that also I would never recommend anyone necessarily ever read. The Stranger falls into that category. Mm. Yeah, so. it is uniquely that. It's like, yeah. I'm not sad that I read it for educational purposes. Yeah. And if it w every single copy were burned up in a mass bonfire of the vanities, the world would be a better place. You know, I would say because it's so short and because it's fairly well written and entertaining, it might be my, here's your one book. You want to get, you want to see what this is all about thing for someone with a certain level of maturity. Yeah. If you maybe. want to see what existentialism I'd, gets you. I'd have to think about it, but maybe, maybe if there was one, I, I, I'm having a hard time thinking of a book I'd rather give them. I mean, even Kierkegaard is going to be so in the weeds and waiting for Godot. Oh boy. <laughs> they wait a long time for Godot. <laughs> they wait a long time for that guy. He never shows up. He never shows up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be a little self-righteous here, Nathan, mm -hmm. but to be a lot self-righteous. Yes. <laughs> I would just give them Ecclesiastes. Oh, uh, well, okay. Yes, well. <laughs> yeah, well. All is vanity. Spoken <laughs> like a pastor. <laughs> Spoken like a pastor. <laughs> well, as the resident atheist scum, <laughs> I'm going to give them the stranger. Or how, do you say, how do you say it? Le tranger. Le tranger. Uh -huh. The toilet. Le toilet. <laughs> Le toilet. <laughs> Uh, baggage Maybe, with Hemingway. You stars. What? Hemingway. You didn't say any baggage with Hemingway. You guys used to box in the 1920s? We did. I still dig him up occasionally and box with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Put the bones in different boxes. I am mean. the one who shot him. Yeah. I was hired by the CIA to do it. I always thought Hemingway I made it look like an inside job. What? I always thought Hemingway <laughs> shot him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like inside his own head. Yeah, job. yeah. And inside. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. It was Melville that came to you from the CIA, right? Mm -hmm. The first Hemingway I ever read was For Whom the Bell Tolls. For Whom the Bell Tolls. Then last summer, I got into a kick. I got one of these paid, not pay, one of these free services where I could download some good literature and read, uh, listen while I was driving around. And so I got into a Hemingway kick and there were these versions that were read by really good American actors. Mm -hmm. And I downloaded a Farewell to Arms and I just happened to be listening to it while I was like driving through 
corn country, Illinois, where it's hot and dry. And it just felt like I was there in Spain and I was really digging it. And then the ending kind of comes out of nowhere. And so I think I texted one of you guys. Yeah, I remember said, this. I like uh, this, this book just completely, like it, it shocked me the way it ended. And I didn't know if I liked it or not. And so I really wanted to talk about it. You mean you didn't catch on to the foreshadowing when he's like, life breaks everyone and kills the best yeah, people. I did. But also when you're listening as you're driving, you don't pick up on everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And enough. so I think this is the kind of book that reads, listens best when you're driving and you don't have a whole lot of time to pay attention because you're also trying to avoid hating the tractor that's driving really slow in front of mm -hmm. you. So yeah, that's, this is the kind of book that I would recommend reading in that way. Now, having sat down and read it, nah, I don't think this ranks as far as Hemingway's best stuff. It has some really beautiful passages. I still think that the escape on the, on the river at night, it's really good. It's really great writing. He makes you feel like you're there. And there are parts where like in the Spanish countryside where you feel like you're there. Mm -hmm. The whole march. But, yeah. The whole, the whole it's retreat. It's just he has some great- Everything from basically- Anything that doesn't have Catherine- yeah, once yeah. he leaves her in the hospital and rejoins in their in retreat. Yeah. All the way up. And then, but Catherine's there for the river. Yeah. And that's just, that's a pretty awesome. Yeah. But, just, if, but if all we had was he's the retreat and then he jumps off the river and makes his daring escape, that would be an awesome little book that we'd all be reading Yeah, I guess about. other than the moral questions we'll be asking probably in this podcast because you'll make us do it, Nathan. Mm -hmm. But it's a um, jerk. It's a jerk. <laughs> Sorry. It's I, so I would say that. So what I've, so my reaction now, I've been able to kind of step back and look at that initial reaction. I think my shock was more disappointment mm -hmm. because I think he took a cheap way out. Yeah. Yep. And I think that what this book shows you is his, why he became famous is because he really is cinematic in his style. Mm -hmm. His style doesn't get in the way of you just feeling the story. And that means that you feel particularly betrayed by the ending because you feel that he should have known better. The ending is, I mean, I know we're going to talk about Because his realism it. really works. It's its so didactic. It's its yeah. worse than any Christian literature that just puts a moral on it's, the end, just tacks oh, it on. Yeah. It, it's such a, it's such a, it tells you so much. It, it's like, like, I wanted to make this point and I don't care if it But Hemingway has tracks yeah. with the story. The point that he wanted really, I mean, it's wish fulfillment. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool? Worst. Wouldn't it be cool is actually the point. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to like go and sort of like be a war hero and kill people and have a woman and get her pregnant and then get to walk away from all the responsibility mm -hmm. because, oh, darn, they all died and get to get to enjoy the sadness of it right. at the same time. Yeah, the aesthetic while, beauty of the whole thing Yeah, is you get to enjoy the aesthetic beauty of absolutely every aspect yeah. of this, including yeah. the death of my woman and her child and cool, now no responsibilities, and I get to go back home and start yeah, over. Yeah, it's a really irresponsible way to tell a story. Dickens did it with David Copperfield. Spoilers. Oh, he, yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. And I've always been irritated at Dickens for that. He gives himself what he feels he deserved in life mm -hmm. through art. And so Hemingway is kind of doing the same thing. You can tell it's written by an – he, he was, what, 30 when this was published? He was immature. Yeah. And as one of the things that I, I've really enjoyed – with the bookening and going back and looking at things is you can, uh, we have the freedom as older men to realize that a young writer in his early thirties or your twenties doesn't necessarily have anything deep to tell us about mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Like the, I think that it, there's good reason that Tolstoy's best work was when he was an old man. Yeah. And so, and that's fine. We don't have to feel the insecurity of the young writer being obviously gifted like a musician with his style. I mean, man, could the guy write? Yeah, and so... Or man, could Maxwell Perkins edit? Oh, yeah, man, could Maxwell... That's, that's partly the case. I mean, Although Hemingway could write. I mean, it's... He it's, could. It's not fair to say he couldn't. And that's where his genius comes through, and he had it even as a young man. But right, writing fiction, is a, it's, a, it's a strange art. Like, you have these young poets who are really talented as young poets, and so Sylvia Plath and all these people... But one thing I've just come to realize more and more is that unlike music, where you can have a genius like a Chopin or a Mozart writing beautiful music at a young age, with, with literature, there's so much of experience and understanding of the world and just this depth of character that a young person just can't get. Like, have you ever read Hemingway's first book, the one about Princeton? No. 
or not Hemingway, Fitzgerald's. Oh, okay. That's what I meant. Fitzgerald's first book. What's that called? It, it is pretty. It reads like a young man's understanding of life. It's very cheap and one dimensional. Mm -hmm. And so, anyways. How's that my con? How's that my relationship to Hemingway? <laughs> <laughs> you hate young people. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and so I was just, I was disappointed by this. I, I, I thought that he should, it was felt like an immature answer. And to, and I think that for him, the bell tolls is definitely a more mature understanding of at least the guys being heroic there at the end, but there's still some wish fulfillment even there. <laughs> yes. Rap. And so I think this time around, I was really fascinated by, so Hemingway's style, that's what I was wanting to say. It's, it does not get in the way, but it's one, it's really fascinating. You can admire it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't force you to admire it either because you can just enjoy it. Like you can just enjoy what he's telling you as well. And the only other writer who kind of does that as well is Tolstoy. Like I, I can completely lose myself in the scene, like the Christmas Troika ride in War and Peace. I don't even think about the words as I'm reading it, right. really. Mm -hmm. You can just see it happening. It doesn't feel like he's And Hemingway off, yeah. is the same way. You can just feel at times these things happening. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating to watch because they both are masters of style. And so I think that they had that rare ability to do that where they're scratching both itches. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think Hemingway's great there, but I, I don't know if he ever became a mature individual. Like even Old Man in the Seed doesn't seem like a mature person's response to life. It still has that sort of malaise and sadness to it that you just wish the guy would have grown up well actually if you're going to give a high school student one book to kind of wrap their head around existentialism that wasn't going to also kill them oh, man, old man yeah. see might be a good one yeah and obviously i mean his eventual suicide just proves that he never did grow up mm -hmm. yeah he's a weird stunted guy my baggage <laughs> is Similar, I guess, to you guys. I mean, I had my dalliance with existentialism and all that sort of stuff. I've read The Stranger. I've read some Sartre. I've read... And I, 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 I might even be worse because I didn't have to read these things for classes. I was just like, yay! The Stranger and Sartre and <laughs> hell is other people. <laughs> you, you, you get it. Sartre. So, I don't know. What is there to say? The Stranger... I think the piece of baggage I'll mention with The Stranger is that I'm pretty f familiar with pop French existentialism, by which I mean I've seen all the films of Jean-Luc Godard and all the stuff that's a little downstream of this, all the movies, the French New Wave stuff. I'm, I've, I've seen all that stuff, and I dis absolutely despise it. It is just so fake disaffected, and it thinks it's so cool, and it's usually just people smoking cigarettes and having sex and kind of going to bistros and gay parry and it's it's just so smarmy and self-satisfied and it, the stranger really feels like the progenitor of all that stuff it's like how can we make this intellectual movement cool well let's have disaffected people smoking cigarettes that really helps it and so I think it's when I look at this stuff, when I read it, I see it less as a intellectual movement and more as a pose, as a style and a very successful pose and a very successful style in terms of its cultural impact and a pose and a style that have helped sell a pretty cheap intellectual movement. But man, I, I am sick and tired of the part of myself that ever wanted to watch that stuff. And I'm sick and tired of this kind of stuff. Hemingway. I still remember my first reading of For Whom the Bell Tolls with a lot of fondness. That was a very visceral book in the way that Brandon was just describing, the pine needles, all that sort of stuff. Just uh, the cave that they lived in and the... the yeah, caves are. strong images still. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not... Caves will do that. You, yeah, you guys are smirking because I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about did the earth move and all that stuff. I'm talking more sure about... Sure you're not. Well, maybe it was. Maybe it was. But the, the battle scenes, th there's a couple of vignettes that are so... Just, I would say, some of the best stuff we've read on the bookening, right up there with... Well, like the a Spanish captain who's on top of that hill, trapped. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's amazing. Pretty, that's a, yeah. The best battle scene we've read. It just sticks with you. It sticks with you. Or the when they execute all the, the bourgeois in the town or whatever, yeah. they make them oh, run off a cliff or yeah, something. It's just that. an amazing... When she's telling that when story. Pilar shows up. Yeah. yeah. An amazing set yeah. piece. The be, one and of the I best things... I remember their names. Yeah. Pilar and Pablo. Yeah, you'd have to... 
even if there was something attractive about did the earth move, Maria was a pretty <laughs> lame fantasy. Even for a 20 year old or whatever I was, it was like, come on, Hemingway, this is a get over yourself. This is a paper thin caricature of what you wish a woman would be like this. Not like Catherine. Yeah, not like Catherine. Oh, darling, did I do it right? Did it? Did, am I? Am I? I'll be ever so good for you, darling. Not like her at all. But <sighs> man. I'm losing my train of thought because I'm so annoyed with Hemingway's lame depiction of women. But the non-sex stuff and for whom the bell tolls is a lot of it. Some of the best stuff that we've read. I mean, even just drinking wine in that cave with with the snow. Yeah, the final thing that leads to Robert Jordan's uh, famous demise. In the birth of the Wheel of Time series. In the birth of the Wheel of Time series. The Pine Needles. I mean, that book contains all the material of one of the best books we've read. It just contains a lot of other things too, unfortunately. But I have fondness for that book and fondness for the time in my life when I, I, I was so excited to encounter it for the first time and it felt so original. Yeah. But but because of that, and that was around the same time that I read Hemingway's short fiction, which some of his best work, we never get a chance to talk about it on the podcast, but maybe next time we decide we want to do Hemingway for whatever reason, if we decide we <laughs> want to do Hemingway again, we should just do his short fiction. I don't know why we haven't already done it because stories like The Killers or Hills with White Elephants or... With White Elephants. Like White Elephants. The Hills are alive. The Hills being alive with White Elephants. It's a wild story. It's like that scene from Dumbo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hills versus White Elephants, Dawn of Justice. (laughs) These are all great stories and really they are are as much what Hemingway is good at and what we should talk about. And that was all exciting. Old Man in the Sea was exciting. Uh, I've never been able to read until for this podcast, uh, Farewell to Arms. Like I've, I, I, even when I was in my period where I was just like excited to be discovering Hemingway, I could not get into it. It just takes so long to get going as a story. And there's all this there's journalistic really not much stuff. Of a story for yeah. the first, what, third of the book or half of the book or something? Yeah. All that stuff about like, well, it was snowing and a caravan walked by today. The the stuff that feels a little bit more just like a diary, a real diary entry. I'm sure it was very vivid for people at the time. And I, I'm not sure that I begrudge the book having it, but it, it did defeat me again and again and again. I've tried this book as a Hemingway fan and just never found an entry point until I had to do it for the podcast. And even then I would say this book, yeah, the retreat and stuff grabbed me, but there's nothing about this book that grabbed me like the best of Hemingway. I have read also Sun Also Rises and To Have and Have Not, I believe I've read, and some other books, and they all have their qualities, but this is, for me, one of the least successful Hemingway books. There's just... It's the least successful that I've read. Yeah. So. This this guy is... Well, actually, what's that sound? Oh, man, it's the camera clicking, bringing us into... The big picture, the big picture, the part where we talk about the the big picture. So I, th- I think we're, we've already maybe said a lot of this, but let me just finish my big picture, which is this book just never gives me a reason to care. I don't yeah. even, even by comparison, I would say Robert Jordan and Mar- Maria fairly successful. Like, yeah, you kind of like them and you're pulling for Robert Jordan and he's a much cooler existential character hero than this guy, whatever his name is, Henry, I think. Henry is what I think it is too. Yeah. I don't even, didn't even bother learning this guy's name. Same. And I mean, Maria is such a cartoon character that she kind of achieves her own grandeur or so, or interest by being a cartoon character. Whereas Catherine is so coquettishly. Just a sex doll kind of. Yeah, yeah. Se- she's just a talking sex doll. It, she's just so boring. And, and she's not like interestingly bad. She's just like. One dimensional. Just one dimensional. Deliberately uninteresting. And then the ways where he tries to make her. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Maria was one dimensional and therefore kind of fascinating. Like, whoa, you reduced everything to this. And Catherine's just like, you know, okay, you reduced everything to this. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just, this book is like a, it's like one of the, every time, anytime I see a painting of a bowl of fruit that's done really well, I'm like, why did you paint a bowl of fruit? Like, this could be the best painting of a bowl of fruit in the world, but it's who, still a bowl. It's of still fruit. a bowl of fruit. Who cares? You haven't given me a reason to care. It doesn't matter how well executed it is. This book is a bowl of fruit book for me. It's, 
I guess you could argue Take it. some art history, Nathan. It's well, yeah. Well, okay. I'm sorry. Learn about what all the it, fruit symbolizes in the various little elements. But, but the thing is, I've, I've been taking art history with Brandon for years, and I still don't like this ball of fruit. Like, uh, it doesn't matter how well executed it does. It doesn't matter what it meant. It's just like it does not give me a reason to care about this man or about this woman or about their adventure. So it's probably because you keep trying to eat the painting. <laughs> yeah. Well, and. <laughs> <laughs> for whom the for, for whom the belt was? What is it called? Farewell Arms was delicious, a little pulpy, yeah. <laughs> a little pulpy, but it went down. Coming out the other end, not as good. Oh man, I don't know. I agree with you. I I had a lot. I mean, I just had. I was far enough ahead in my reading. This everything did sort of grind to a halt with with Farewell to Arms, but I was just sort of like, well, I'll read a couple pages every night, and because it's a thing I've got to do, and it's part, uh, I'm just gonna. This is my nightly routine. Mm-hmm. I just read a couple pages every night. And Hemingway should be like, oh, man, the bookening. Well, it was fun to read, you know, uh, Mogham, but th- I had to do that for the podcast. But now I get a break. I get to read some Hemingway. He's going to be just like reading a pot, pot boiler from the, the grocery store. Like, it'll, it'll just read. Yeah. It'll, yeah. it'll take care of itself to have you actually yeah, stall out on Hemingway. So long. Well, The Stranger was actually the same. So, it was like, that's how I'd been going, plugging it, it, but it was just like self-discipline plugging along. We're not looking forward. Every night, I was rarely looking forward to it until we got to a couple of those scenes where, okay, we're in the retreat now, and now it's compelling and cool. We're in the river chase or the river escape scene. That's compelling and cool. Right. But, I mean, that stuff doesn't happen until, what, two-thirds of the way through the book? Yeah, it's one of those so, things like sometimes you'll... Like, where's the plot and where are the people I'm supposed to care about and why? Like, I don't even remember. And I had a hard time while I was reading the book remembering who was who. Right. It's like, this is just a this is just a failure of... There's a cutoff point where it's like, if the movie makes me wait this long until it delivers the goods and has the really cool scene, then I'm okay and it retroactively makes everything that came before all right. But if it waits this long, then it doesn't matter how cool the scene is. I'm still irritated that I had to sit through an hour and a half yep. to get to it. And this book very much crossed that line. Yeah. <laughs> much different experience than For Whom the Bell Tolls. For Whom the Bell Tolls, just instantly you're in Robert Jordan's in shoes. You're, yeah. you're climbing up that mountain. Enjoyable cinematic start and cinematic journey. Right. And, and, and you feel yourself like thrown into this adventure with him. You're hiding out. You feel the threat of, are the fascists going to find us? Like, Really compelling stuff that grind to a halt a little bit for me because the earth has to move. But this book's just not the same way. Brandon, your big picture, anything you want to add? Or No, I think that I touched on what I wanted to say with I was disappointed. I felt betrayed. Big picture was I reading it this time. I, I think part of it also was the, the reader. Like I said, it was this American actor series mm-hmm. and the, the, whoever the reader was. I, I need to go back and figure out who it was. Carrot Top. Probably Carrot Top. I think he's Canadian. <laughs> what an amazing pull. <laughs> I think he's Canadian, Nathan. I'm trying to think of somebody with an annoying voice or personality. Pete Davidson. What's the best comedy answer to what Brandon was? Carrot Top, actually. Mitch Hedberg. Mitch Hedberg, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you keep doing that. As What's uh, the guy with the annoying voice? Gilbert Godfrey. Gilbert the one that Godfrey, just died. Yeah, just died. Yeah. yeah, he read it. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would listen to Gilbert Godfrey read this book. Oh, man. I would listen to Gilbert Godfrey's Moby Dick. That, Call me Ishmael. I can do it. Gilbert <laughs> yeah. Godfrey. But yeah, so the actor did a bad job or he just... No, he did a good job reading it. So I liked it. Oh, that was your first reading. Yeah. That's right. And then today... Yeah. You not did today. A, you did a bad job of reading it to I yourself. Read it. Uh, yeah, I was not an actor. So <laughs> wasn't as good. I'm trying to figure out who read this too. Oh, yeah. It was uh, John... You guys know him. He's from Mad Men. John Slattery. Yeah. One yeah. of the, one of the yeah. funniest and most... Best characters. Best characters in the, show. in the show. So yeah, he made it really enjoyable. So I think part of the experience was just having him read the book so i can make a difference i can make a difference that's worth mentioning in baggage (sighs) well we're not in baggage anymore no no no. i'm sorry i'm sorry it would have been worth mentioning camera clicky or whatever but you failed so we got to cut it now yeah Yeah, sorry well yeah slattery will get you nowhere yeah oh boy (laughs) (laughs) what is my life just one big failure after another Nate is very proud of himself. <laughs> I'm miming, putting a medal on my cell phone. Was, so yeah. I just got a medal. He's like um, plotting himself. Yeah. You know, did a bunch of I received several awards in podcasting for saying, Slattery will get you nowhere. Come on. Yeah. That is a grade A piece of podcasting right there. 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Brandon. Brandon, Brandon, Brandon. You're just jealous that you didn't think of it. That is what? That I heard something outside the door. <laughs> Remember when that person was stalking us when we did the Dracula? Dracula? That was really yeah, scary. That yeah, was scary. that's the scariest thing that's ever happened to anyone. <laughs> What's that sound? It's the horns. The heroic fanfare affair of the horns bringing us into the Hall of Heroes. Are we supposed to be talking about both books as we go here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big picture of, I think my context was the big there picture. There is no big picture. There is picture. no big picture. It's just a It's picture. just absurd. It's a guy gets blinded by the sun and shoots someone. <laughs> because. And everybody's trying to make meaning out of it, but nobody can, even him. He's a stranger to himself. I think you have to understand the stranger as a very, as a great piece of populist literature. In other words, I think it does a good job of striking a very cool pose and making all that stuff seem very attractive. Mar- yeah. Marceau is, Marceau's life is actually wish fulfillment. He goes to his job. He doesn't care. He has sex. The woman throws herself at him. He smokes cigarettes. He goes to this cool Algerian beach. And the way it's described and the way it's written with this kind of disaffected, cool sort of almost a, an American, as I said, an American noir style. It just makes it very cool. And I think that that's the only insight that I wish to provide about this book is that you shouldn't understand it as a work of philosophy. You should understand it as a work of propaganda and as a fairly successful one. It might not seem that cool to you if you're mature, but I'm telling you, as a former bit of an existentialist myself, Half the appeal is not actually the philosophy. It's black and white photos of Frenchmen and like black turtlenecks. I mean, why did Steve Jobs choose a black turtleneck? Because that says like intellectual nerd king, cool, sort of debauched, disaffected. Like it's the whole thing. All those guys, Roland Barthes and Jejun and all the post structuralists, they all have their like cigarettes and that you imagine them sitting in cafes late yeah, at night. Foucault. Drinking Foucault. Yeah. Drinking before they go and do unspeakable things to people. Sexually speaking, aren't you glad I, I, I made sure you understood what I meant there? Thank you. But I could have made, gone even farther. So I, I think The Stranger is a very effective book at striking a pose i think it does the same work that jean-luc Godard's breathless or la aventura or some of the 1960s movies that that the reason people are still interested in existentialism the reason that word has a certain kind of cachet and sexiness is not because the books are so great but because the aesthetic is so great because it feels cool it feels noir it feels black and white it feels you smoke cigarettes and you drink and you're bohemian. It's, it's just got a certain thing attached to it that, and I think that's important for why it spread. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it didn't spread just because it was the best philosophy or the most interesting philosophy or the, the one that was the most cogently ex, ex, expressed. It, it just attached itself to an aesthetic and it was natural for it to attach itself to its aesthetic. So I don't know that I have anything else to say about the stranger, but that's my big picture understanding and where I would place it and how I would place it. Can we go to the Hall of Heroes now? Yep. All right. Uh, I think we just need to skip by the Hall of Heroes, right? Because there are none? There are none. Well, what about, I wrote his name, Frederick Henry, that wonderful character in Farewell Farewell Uh, Arms. Here's a question. Can you tell me one thing about this guy? Like who he is, what he wants besides sex with Catherine? He wants sex with Catherine and And that's pretty heroic right there. I don't remember everything about Robert Jordan, but I feel like we knew about his father and mother. We had a sense of who he was before the war, why he came to Spain. Yeah, we do. He's got family in America that just wires him money whenever he asks for it. Frederick Henry does or Robert he Jordan? Yes, Frederick yeah. Henry does, yeah. Probably more similar to what Hemingway's actual experience was, though. Yeah. All these guys with Mommy their... and Daddy, I need money to for <laughs> wine and books. I'll put on my dress again, Mommy. <laughs> Um, I'm going to become a great writer, <laughs> mummy. <laughs> I will make you proud. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> Both of you guys have mummy. Sank into the swamp, and then we built another one, <laughs> and it stood up. <laughs> I just want to sing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brandon's brought Monty Python in it, into this. I'm not sure I'm happy about that. I guess. Huge tracks of. Land. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what he cares about. It's he just tracks of land. It's just a flesh wound that the guy in Sun Also Rises got. 
No, it's not. I was not. at least riffing on the same skit he was. Uh, oh. <laughs> he caught me. Guys. What yes, about, so we uh, should stay here. We're in the... And make sure... He doesn't leave. <laughs> now we're just so we life. should go. <laughs> Where, where's the ambiguity? It's in the box over in the. I'm just, oh come we're on! We're still Nathan. in the castle in Holy Grail over here. And I, you're just, like, jumping I'm all over the so place. sorry. Sometimes it's I very just get absurd. carried away. <laughs> Two will get you a tuppence. What's he say? Uh, wink, wink, nod, nod. Man, Nathan, you wink, are wink, pretty nudge, uncultured nudge, here, buddy. <laughs> Listen. Here's, here's the thing about Monty Python. Slight digression. Monty Python is great. They're very funny. They're very absurdist. But they have been owned by the most obnoxious people. Agree. In Hollywood. Or not in Hollywood. In high school. Agreed. Uh, it's, Agreed it's, with it's, it's, it's never the cool, your cool nerd friend that's quoting Monty Python. It's the jock who's memorized it. And, and the only way he knows how to be funny is to do an entire Monty Python routine. And it's... I'm really jealous of him, and I'm going to shoot him five times in the desert. I agree, Nathan. <laughs> I agree with all those things, okay. but it doesn't change the fact that King Arthur and the Holy Grail is pretty funny. Yeah, it is. It's funny. It's funny. It's very funny. I didn't vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> Some watery tart dispensing swords. It's no basis for a system of government, in my opinion, Brandon. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I like Monty Python. Ho, ho, ho. They, Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Good job. Nathan. All right. Let's let's. We're here in the Hall of Heroes. Isn't there anything else we have to say about? I think his name is Marcel. I have a feeling that Brandon and I could go through and quote all of Monty Python for some reason. Maybe it had to do with something we were in high school. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but you get the coconuts. <laughs> do you guys want to talk any more about Catherine? She's kind of a hero. It's an African swallow. Yeah, she is an African swallow. I don't know that. Ah! <laughs> What's your favorite color? <laughs> Blue. No, green. Yellow! No. <laughs> that part's funny. Uh, I know what's happening with the patrons today. <laughs> so, Catherine's an embarrassing fantasy woman. Yeah. True. She's not a hero. Next. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else? Does she do anything to shade her in? I'm just trying to no. think. No. No, she just is all coquettish and weird and... I'll be good for you, and I'll do, and tell me I'm very good. And I'd sometimes she gets a little wife, sad. Darling. And, yeah. she, at the very beginning, it feels like maybe it's going to be slightly interesting because they're kind of both playing the chess game of seduction. Yeah, but then they realize in, within a page or two that that's stupid, and they should just start sleeping together. Right. <laughs> And that's it's like all it lasts like, for is right. like two pages. Yeah, it's like the checkers game of seduction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, well, this book sucks. <laughs> Speaking of which, what's that sound? <laughs> it's the villain's lair. That's the creepy organ ushering us down to the lair where we decide who is the true villain. Of, of Camus. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think Hemingway. I think they're both the villains <laughs> of their own story. Okay, well. <laughs> Nathan, uh, <laughs> I think you're so disappointed hey, us once right we, now. Once we allowed that in season one. It was uh, the, <laughs> the show was all downhill from there. <laughs> Didn't we make C.S. Lewis the villain? <laughs> did yeah of course we did we never, also made a on the villain of winnie the pooh no one's ever forgiven for us for it <laughs> the sun was beating down there was a a mill <laughs> couldn't help it smarmy little face i've heard the gun go off five times in my hand <laughs> all right is there anything else we want to say about who's the true villain of either one of these books the Nazis. <laughs> the Nazis. They're yeah, you're right. I hate those guys. <laughs> They're not even there. <laughs> not even there. It's World War One. I. <laughs> I guess if I have anything actual to offer here, it would be to say, man, Hemingway really hates God and farewell to arms. Like, it's just pretty explicit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he says, like, life it breaks you or something, but it may as well just be like, there's that passage where he's like, he all but says, I mean, he just does basically just say, well, God kills everyone who has any kind of courage or kindness in this world. And so all you can do is kind of be brave as God breaks you. And then he writes the whole ending of his book to to make that point. So yeah. I want to say God is kind of the villain of Farewell to Arms. Not, not Which that makes I, him the hero. Yes. Because yeah. he, 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 even if the story that Hemingway told... Was this was a story that God told he would be just in it all and it would be well deserved. And so Right. You make him the villain, he's still the hero. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's nothing you can do. Right. Makes me wonder if um Graham Greene didn't write the end of the affair in response to this book. It gives me greater sympathy for the end of the affair. Have you read that one? Mm-hmm. 
I don't know if we can ever do that one on this podcast, but it's- Is it pretty sexual and it's- It's got some pretty explicit scenes, it? but it's kind of the same book, except the guy ends up bitter and angry and that's part of his condemnation because Graham Greene was a pseudo-Christian. And the woman, she doesn't die, right? She, no, she does. Does she? Yeah. I guess maybe it's oh, worth talking right. about the yeah. priest then. Sure. Yeah. Well, he has some sympathy for the priest, I guess, kind of. I mean, of. he's maybe the the most well-rounded character in the book. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because you have, what's the name of his friend, the guy that he thinks is going to get syphilis because he's just such a Latin lover type. I don't know anybody's name. Sylvester. Yeah, let's call him Sylvester. <laughs> Something like that. There's actually a series of them. There's these swarthy Italian guys. Yeah, Everywhere yeah. our hero goes, he meets another kind of just man of the people Italian guy. Right. And they're all the same. I think one of them is named Carlo, maybe. But the kind of guy that Hemingway wished he was. Right. So like, you have all those like people. The bullfighter from Sun Also Rises. They're just simple. They enjoy wine. They enjoy women. They 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 yeah. do their job. They don't worry too much about the bigger picture. He loves those kinds of guys. The communists, of course, they're all communists because yeah. that's that's what's cool. Yep. And then you have them all picking on the priest. And our hero doesn't really give the priest much of the time of day. He's a little nicer to the priest than he is these than Carl the Carlos of the book are. Yeah, but you also get the feeling that Carlo Carlo has more respect for the priest than the, I don't know, it's sort of a weird vibe. Yeah. It's a weird vibe, that's all. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, you're right. I mean, I, I, I didn't really have anything else to say about it. I'm just, I'm not sure where Hemingway, the priest is obviously out of his element. And, and by the way, what's that sound? We're in the crawlway of secondary characters. If you hear that cave-like drip, drip, drip of the crawlway of I secondary characters. Yeah, yeah. Brandon hears the cave-like drip, drip, drip all the time in his brain. This Saturday, no, Sunday afternoon, we're going on a trip called the annual regatta, mm -hmm. where you take floaties and you float 100 feet down the stream into a cave and then go caving. It's going to be fun. Sounds great. What's wrong with you? <laughs> At least tell me that these are like arm floaties, like when you, you're a kid, these those little orange arm floaties. Dude, they're supposed to be as ridiculous as possible. This is the way they celebrate <laughs> I mean, the beginning of spring. It, you have to appeal to the kind of person who likes to go caving, so yeah. it would have to be pretty ridiculous in my opinion. Elliot wants me to get him a unicorn floaty. That, that would be cool. Yeah. yeah. What's it called? A regatti? Regatta. Regatta. You realize a regatta is not a, a, a noodle that you can stuff in your fat face. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. I did <laughs> not know Public that. service announcement. <laughs> I'm going to write them now and say, on second thought. <laughs> let's, let's not, not go, go there. Let's not go to <laughs> It's a silly place. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I got him. I don't know. So does Hemingway have sympathy for the priest? The priest isn't a man like what Hemingway thinks men should be. I think he does have sympathy for him. I don't know if I can build a case as to why. I just felt like he's not despised right? by Hemingway. He right. is. And I think part of it is because of the way the other guys do treat him and joke around with him and stuff like that. Right. That builds sympathy naturally for him. So I guess if we're talking about secondary characters. We got to talk about the sun and the stranger. The sun. Oh, the sun. The, thing the, 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 the thing that causes it's hot. everything. That's a cool scene, I have to say. Or a hot scene. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty hot. He, uh, he does a good, you're right. He does a good job making you see the confusion and. Well, and just the, the way yeah. that time in its absurd way seems to come to an absolute standstill and mm -hmm. the inevitable, the feeling of inevitability, the feeling of the, the dreamlike feeling of, well, I just actually have to shoot this guy to even make the scene move forward because the sun has stopped everything and it's beating down on me and we're just caught in kind of a matrix like and what he does a loop. good job of actually there is i mean we've all been in those sorts of situations where you something happens an arab's in front of you and you shoot them yeah, you, just, <laughs> you don't know why but they just make you angry <laughs> but you're you're in a situation where things happen that you don't completely feel like you're in control of mm -hmm. yeah so. and you find yourself acting in ways that feel Absurd. Faded, Faded. and absurd. Yeah. And you're outside of yourself watching yourself, wondering yeah. why you're doing what you're doing. Yep. But feeling like you, I guess, didn't have much of a choice. Yeah. Well, that's why we can't discount the skill with which he evokes this. I mean, I think that's why I went on and on about it being such a successful pose. Be because it is. He, his novel is well done. It, it is. It, he's, a, he's a gifted writer. He's a gifted writer. I think he was a better novelist than he was philosopher. Yes. And it, so it captures that I've, malaise. Because I've, I've read a couple other of his things and I, I liked The Plague. Mm -hmm. I remember en enjoying these books when I first read them. I'm just tired of the philosophy and the people who like his. What I'm more exhausted about are the reformed 
hip Christians who grab onto this sort of thing and Dostoevsky and Cormac McCarthy and try to say everybody should read these because they're so deep, man. And mm-hmm. they'll make you understand life in a way that... Acquaint you with the darkness. Yeah. Oh, especially in the when... the world and inside of you. Especially when talented people like Tolstoy or our new friend, best friend Melville are already doing the work of acquainting you with darkness and doing it in a much more... Mature, is Melville, mature, irresponsible way. Yeah. Is Melville going to replace that uncomfortable spot Shakespeare's always had up in the top tier? Because we never can talk about Shakespeare naturally on this podcast, except for his context. But... Melville, I think we're going to do. You got Tolstoy, Melville, and Austin up there. Like he's yeah. going to join the like the triumvirate of yeah. opening awesomeness. It's fine with me. I think we have yeah. to wait until that podcast to give him the medal. We can't declare it right now. Yeah, but Shakespeare can be like the Pope. He's just he this weird he's position just outside. That, yeah, he's outside. Yeah. He's of like it all. Melchizedek. You know? Yeah. So yes. 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 Otherly. Yeah. Weirdo that you don't understand who he is or where he came from. You but know, you know that, he's important. Right. And you know that he deserves that importance. Right. Yep. But you can't really but trace his good lineage. Good luck talking and, about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. What's that sound? It's the, the sound, sound of us talking about anything other than these books. <laughs> <laughs> that was the sound, but it's also the sound of the speeding roadster bringing us into twists and turns. <laughs> the, ah, <laughs> the part of the book. How about book. the most predictable twist and turn of all time? They all died. They all died. Well, is there anything else you guys want to say? I guess the twist and turn in the the twist is in the stranger as he shoots the guy for some reason, for no reason, for for being an Arab, yeah, for vague vague reasons. And the twist in uh, old uh, Hemingway is that Catherine and her baby die. Yep, I think I think we've already said everything we want to say about those. Is there anything yeah, else? I mean, I feel bad saying this because Brandon was surprised by it, but I. have Felt like it was super obvious that that was what was going to happen, especially when you have all these, not just the philosophical, you know, <clears throat> life and death are going to crush you all, mm-hmm. but th- I have narrow hips mm-hmm. and the, the little things that she did. Yeah, I think that, that, that put in her mouth. Oh, and, darling, do you think I'll be good at having babies? I don't quite do remember. I'll, I'll die. <laughs> I don't remember the conversations we had <laughs> when I first read this. I think my... By surprise, I meant that the whole time I was listening, I was hoping that's not what Hemingway was going to do. Because you can definitely see that he's hinting towards it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're just yeah. hoping, surely you're not going to do that, buddy. Yeah. Because it really was just, dis- it was so disappointing. And this time I, when I was reading, I was like, yeah, you can just see it all over the place. But it's just like, and he actually had lots of different endings for this book. He tried to make, he did other things. Like he wanted other things to work. Right. Messed with it, but eventually landed on this. Well, and he wrote so many different, just what's the final sentence? It is a beautiful final sentence. Yeah. I tried to say goodbye, but it was like saying goodbye to a corpse. I got out, got up and walked outside into the rain. It's a nice, here it is. I, I wrote it down. But after I had got them out and shut the door and turned off the light, it wasn't any good. It was like saying goodbye to a statue. After a while, I went out and left the hospital and walked back to the hotel in the rain. I know he... Worked and 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 worked to try and get just the right cadence and just the right amount of stuff there. And it's nicely done. But I mean, the other thing about this is I just think it's really hard to write a book about the fickle finger of fate. It's something that's difficult to do in art, actually, as much as art tries to do it, because you just always feel the author scheming behind the scenes to make it happen. And so... You were supposed to get at like life is just cruel and capricious, but it all always feels so designed and contrived. Yeah, exactly. And it's so hard. It's something that I admire about the absurd universe that like the Coen brothers create. Like they they create stuff that just feels like I'm not saying they're great moralists or movies. You should necessarily watch all of them, but they are very good at that sort of. Actually, I would say Cormac McCarthy, speaking of Coen brothers, is pretty good at that (laughs) sense of random stuff random terrible stuff yeah but, does just happen but the the beautiful thing about it is the level of design that you have to attain to in order to achieve that sense of chaos is absurd it's absurd yeah your whole it, book has to be actually and, driving towards that end and therefore it points out the absurdity of the position right it, it, it nothing more clearly illustrates it than the fact that the in order to pull it off you have to be a top tier one half of 1% genius in order to get close. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, you're right. 
for Anton Chigurh to work as well as Anton Chigurh does, you have to be a genius. Right. And orchestrate it all for it to work, or even for the TV series based on right, the Fargo. Fargo. Yeah. It's all just so intricately designed, mm -hmm. the way it works. Intricately yeah. designed in order to... Seem absurd. Well, there's our first bookening book, The Intricate Design of Chaos. So some just a couple points of context that I actually think are interesting for this. Apparently, Hemingway's wife was going through a cesarean section as he decided which ending to use. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a great guy, Yeah, as always. And... <laughs> And also there are apparently, in 2012, an edition of this book was published. It had 47 alternate endings that he had gone through. Hmm. So he did not feel, this was a book he didn't know how to end. And I think that he chose poorly. He chose poorly. Yeah, it certainly feels that way. Well, here's something fun. What's that sound? We're going into the salon of style. That's why we hear like the... I don't know, the sound of the French people talking or whatever it is. I don't know what the sound effect is, but we're going into the salon of style. Is there anything you guys want to say about the... I've already made my case that The Stranger has a great style for propaganda, but I don't know that I have anything else to say about that. Hemingway is obviously a great stylist. I think I talked about his style when I was giving my baggage. So I think, they're, I think that is what both of these guys have going for them. Yeah. It's good style. Yeah. And Camus for a philosopher, I mean, it's really him and Nietzsche. They're I the don't two. Know. Yeah, that's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah. There's really nobody close. And and that is a level of efficaciousness that is uh, compelling. That's why the two of them have some of the greatest hold on the moral imagination of the public. Yeah. Much more so than many more sophisticated philosophers. Yeah. I, th I would say... And rightfully so, because I think philosophy is just bonk. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that too. That too. I, I would say I like Hemingway. I don't know. It's interesting, Brandon. You said Hemingway's style you like here because it's so getting out of the way. It's yeah. just transporting you. I actually think both Old Man and the Sea and For Whom the Bell Tolls to take the two other books we've read are more transportive precisely because they actually do get in the way a little bit more by which i mean they take a few more risks they have a few more bold metaphors they're they're a little splashier a little co more colorful he's so battened down here so hemingway-ish so afraid to do anything but show you the very tip of the iceberg that it ends up feeling just a little bit cold and reductive even for hemingway hmm. to agree. me i agree with that i especially in the i mean i think to in the sense, okay, maybe he doesn't get in the way in terms of the style, but I think little things like the accents get in the way mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that just makes everything feel that much more reductive right. because of his imitation of the Italian is just, yeah. Cheesy. It's just cheesy. In, in a way that his silly. imitation of the Spanish is not. It's not. Yeah. yeah it, feels, well, it's, it has more life. The Spanish in that book just has more life and verve and... Well, he takes a really silly risk in For Whom the Bell Tolls. He has them all speak in this kind of the, thou, Old English, which is his equivalent of high Spanish. Uh, Spanish scholars apparently laugh like he's not really doing a good job of capturing anything about Spanish. But he does create really colorful characters with a really specific milieu that you can feel and enter into. Whereas this book, yeah, it's kind of silly with the Italian, but it's also, it's like you need to either go big and go broad actually or you need to really keep it clamped down but to try and kind of split the difference just gets what gets us what we have here which is something that's just not that compelling yeah and i find that for all the uh, meredith's professor called this for farewell to pants i think maybe one of us wrote that in the books that we sent out to our patrons i think jake did yeah jake is famous for his uh, the vulgarisms that he puts into books that we send to people but there's just not a lot of juice even immoral juice in in the I think I wrote so long arms. So long, yeah. You wrote so long arms. Oh uh, yeah. I, think I mean, I Brandon wrote fair, more like farewell to pants. Yeah. That is what Brandon wrote. There's just there's nothing particularly romantic in the way. I mean, I don't find like the boat boat escape scene. That's right. You said take that arms. Yeah, take, take that, that arms. Take that arms. That's pretty funny. That's funny. There's just there's not a lot of crackle to the romantic stuff. There's there's not a lot of attempts at even the tawdry sex stuff from for whom the bell tolls which would be tawdry and bad but at least it would be interesting like it's just more like i wanted to be between the sheets with Catherine, and, so I was. and now i was <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it's like 
Okay. <laughs> Pro- provocation just doesn't age very well. That's the lesson that every writer of every era needs to learn. You'd be hard pressed to name someone who was trying to be provocative in their time and it's just aged like fine wine and, and it's still either it simply doesn't feel provocative anymore, which is kind of the case with this actually, or it just feels stupid and weird, like for whom the bell Why tolls. Why did you put that in there? Like what? Why are you talking about the earth moving and rabbits and stuff? A <laughs> weirdo. So yeah, I this book had some beautiful passages passages though. I mean I did like the the baptism in the river when he jumps in and gets out and then he's thinking about his life and the passages the passages where Hemingway does take some risks and does go big and colorful I liked where he starts saying you would do this or you would do that you wanted to be in your bed where he starts using second person I wrote one down you did not love the floor of a flat car nor guns with canvas jackets and the smell of vaseline metal or a canvas that rain leaked through although it is very fine under a canvas and pleasant with guns but even loved someone else whom now you knew was not even to be pretended there you see you seeing now very clearly and coldly, not so coldly as clearly and emptily, you saw emptily lying on your stomach, having been present, when one arm moved back and another came forward. You had lost your cars and your men as a floor walker loses the stock of his department in a fire. There was, however, no insurance. You were out of it now. You had no more obligation. If they shot floor walkers after a fire in the department store because they spoke with an accent, they always had, then certainly the floor walkers would not be expected to return when the store opened again for business. They might seek other employment if there was any other employment and the police did not get them. It's kind of silly, but I appreciate the... The attempt. The effort to break out of the, he did this, and then he did that. And yeah, then he so did that's the after he thing. emerges on the train, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And so for all of, I guess, my... Pretending like the details are gone and vague and stupid. I don't know anybody's name. I instantly placed that quote yeah. in context. Yeah, it's, it's it's not a book that I'm sorry to have read, I guess, but we can, we can get to that. What's that sound? We're entering... Oh, it's the heavenly choir ushering us into the haven of reflection upon deeper meaning. Mm. <laughs> Here, I'll just read the quote. If people bring so much courage to this world... The world has to kill them, to break them. So, of course, it kills them. The world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break, it kills. It kills the very good, and the very gentle, and the very brave, impartially. If you are none of these, you can be sure it will kill you too. (laughs) But there will be no special hurry. So I guess the villain is the world. Yeah. Which is God. I mean, yeah. I think the difference between fatalism that works and fatalism that doesn't is you have to feel like the characters had a shot to do something else. You get to the end of For Whom the Bell Tolls and the ending's pretty sad because you're like, if things had just gone a little differently, Robert Jordan yeah. could have should have could have gotten away and had a great life with Maria living on a little villa in the Spanish countryside or whatever, live to fight another day. But instead, they went wrong, and now he's going to die in the pine needles, and isn't that sad? But you never have a feeling like Catherine has any shot, like things could have... Mm-hmm. It's just like, well, the, the god, the capricious gods of this maddening, stupid universe don't want poor he- Mr. Henry to be happy, and so... Yeah. It's the difference between what makes Shakespeare great and what makes Greek tragedy to me so frustrating. Greek tragedy is just always like, they were doomed to have to sleep with their mothers and kill their fathers or whatever. The chorus said they were doomed for, for that from the very beginning. And then it turned out they, they were, were. Doomed. Like, well, okay. Surprise. surprise. <laughs> wow. How dramatic. <laughs> but Shakespeare is just always like, Oh man, if Macbeth hadn't gotten there in time, then those people wouldn't have died and the guy wouldn't be sad. And it's anyway. So if Romeo would have known that, the priest had done the thing. And right. Then... It's just so close and they missed it. And sometimes people miss it and everything goes wrong. And that's really sad. That's what makes a great, a great tragedy or a great rom- book of romantic fatalism. But this book ain't it because it just, you just f- see the gears and feel the gears moving and feel the machinations. And like you guys were saying, somebody like Cormac McCarthy is a genius who can hide the gears, hide the machinations, 
well enough that it just feels like, whoa, I'm entering into a world of capriciousness and yeah. sick fate and all this stuff. But Hemingway, at least in this book, lacks the maturity and the skill to, to give you that. Anything else you guys want to say here in the haven of reflection upon deeper meaning, deeper meanings in the stranger? I mean, I'm sure we're frustrating a lot of people by not <laughs> reflecting on the deeper meanings of the stranger, but it really, there's not a whole lot to I mean, reflect on. The, our opening riff was it. That's the meaning. That's all there is. Life is and Kamu would agree. Life is absurd. Everyone's going to die. This guy's going to die a little sooner, but you're going to die too. S stuff happens. So what? So what? Everybody's out there grasping for meaning. Man up and just live your life. Mothers are weird and annoying, and Except father figures try and impose their meaning on us, like priests and judges and people like that. You just need to get angry and tell them to get out of your cell, because it's not their right to impose any more meaning on you than anything else, and they don't know what they're talking about. Yep. But I guess they'll go on with their bourgeois lives. Until they die. Until they die. And they're going to die. Yep. They're just fighting against it, fighting against knowing it, fighting against facing it. Trying to, and therefore caught up in this absurd will to power sort of thing where if I can impose my will on other people, I feel like I've got some sense of meaning and control in my own life in this chaotic, meaningless existence. I, I can now see the strings. I can see the gears. Everybody's just coping with the meaninglessness in their own idiotic, absurd way. And it's all absurd. So the judge has his stupid hat and he does his stupid little dance and everybody feels like they understand and have control over their lives and because they have control over me and they can and tell my story and define the reality and put motives into, you know, my mind and my hands and I know better than that. So do you. And what a joke. It's all a big joke. Yep. Carmen McCarthy, the judge just dances with a bear. Yeah. That's great. That's great. That's why everyone should read Blood Meridian. <laughs> That's a joke. Don't read Blood Meridian. Yeah, I think I think we said it. That's the point of the strange. Uh, sex is good. It's kind of fun though. Sometimes. Sometimes. If a woman's throwing at herself at you, you might as well have sex with her. Might as well. Yeah. <laughs> Try not to make too many promises you can't keep. Right. Also, the water is nice. Swimming mm -hmm. is nice. It feels good. The sun when it's not too hot. Mm -hmm. When it's too hot, you end up shooting someone. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's it all... Happens to me all the time. Well, yeah. Um, obviously, we've all shot people because the sun's too hot. I think it's all a metaphor for race. I think he's uncomfortable with Arabs, as he calls them. As he calls them. We need to read this through a colonial lens. It's an Algerian, <clears throat> displaced Algerian writing. Mm -hmm. I, I think we could get a whole other two hours out of this podcast. If oh, we I'm a bunch of stupid sure we could. Crap about it. If we say a bunch of stupid crap about it, yeah. <laughs> Let's say a bunch of stupid crap about it. <laughs> well, what I think that on subconsciously, really, this book is about Camus struggling with the realities of his own unconscious desires towards Arabs mm -hmm. mm. and his guilt as a French colonial having lived in the colonialized place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... Oh, yeah. That's a really profound insight, I think. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I we mean, can start bringing in some, like, object da theory well, and stuff. Well, I think, I think what we need to understand Zizek or and, grapple with is the degree to which this was subconscious or conscious. Was yeah. he processing this consciously and sort of putting it out there for us to grapple with? Yeah. Would we have absurdly killed somebody and connected it to the color of their skin? Isn't that what we're all doing all the time? Well, there's the colonial reading, but there is also the Freudian reading. This is a man. We, we haven't talked enough about the mother figure. The mother, the mother figure. I mean, the first line of the book is mother was dead or something like that, right? Mother yeah. died last night. Mother died last no, night. Wait. Mm -hmm. It was grandmother. This is a man with a, a impotent relationship with his mother, an yeah. impotent relationship with his girlfriend to some extent. And he well, acts, he takes action. Against this Arab with well, a gun of all things. What we really haven't done mm -hmm. is quote a bunch of theorists uh, no, like no, no, Lacan and hey, Zizek and no, Foucault no, no, that hey, we hey, none of us really understand. But uh, we're going to pretend that we do. To help bringing them in because I just want to highlight the fact that Nathan pointed out it was with a gun. Mm -hmm. And the gun represents a gun. 
Yeah. A gun. Yes, yeah. exactly. The gun is always a gun. A gun, <laughs> gun. A gun is never not a gun. Right. Yeah. A gun is always a gun. Phallic symbols everywhere. Woo. Phallic symbols. In the air. In the air. <laughs> yeah. But Brandon was about to... I didn't really want to bring him in. <laughs> I just quote, quote some, some of the great semioticians. Zizek, and, uh, I think you were Zizek, at, Lacan. Yeah. Let me throw around some names so that we can seem even smarter, mm-hmm. you know, and then, uh, yeah. We won't really understand what they're saying, but we'll pretend to, and mm-hmm. we'll say some things with Abjada and all this stuff that'll make us seem like we're pretty smart. It's a post-structuralist I critique. I think the more that I make you repeat those things, the smarter we all feel yeah. about it. There we go. Mm. I feel really good about this. Yeah. Zizek. Da-da-da. Just say it. Just say it. Just say Zizek. 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 Oh, Ooh, our IQ smarter? level is rising. The IQ. <laughs> Listener, don't, no, no, wait, don't this you This is strange. Our, our IQ level is actually going down. <laughs> I, have the, I thought it would go up. I have the monitor right oh, here. No. Oh, no. <laughs> In fact, I think it's low enough that we can move into donor shoutouts. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously. Listen, guys, we have donors to shout out. Uh, so let's shout them out. How meaningless do you think that this person's life is, Brandon? <laughs> On a scale of zero to ten? Zero to zero to five gunshots. Yeah, zero to five gunshots. <laughs> like how many times would I shoot them? Yeah. <laughs> because of how meaningless they are. Robert and Rhonda the Lovebirds. Ooh. Oh. That's a hard that's a hard first one. <laughs> I have to say zero. The mother figure and the father yeah. figure. We get it. Jake, how about the artful Anthony Dodger and his beautiful bride bootstrap Betsy? Five. Yeah, you I, Two and a half bullets apiece. Come on. Uh, little Anthony's Cigar Store. Oh, man. Five. <laughs> Five, yeah. Jimmy Beam and Little Annie Oakley. Five. Lily of the Valley. Five. Inter Nest with the Lovebirds. Five. Wow. Pow, 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 pow. The Keith Masters. Five. That was only three. Pow, pow. Oh, sorry. Pow, pow. Uh, Keith, Billy Davis, Money Men Trucking. Five. John and Jill and Little Baby Max. Pow, pow. Five. Jane and Katie, who are cold love cheese and also C.S. Lewis, including Till We Have Faces. Seven. Yeah, well. Shouldn't have said that thing about C.S. Lewis, guys. Fairy Princess of Wonder and Happiness, Mother Beth? Five. Yep, shoot my mother figure. Council <laughs> Prime Adam? Five. Nothing, not me? Five. Just to be clear, we're saying all of our listeners deserve to be murdered with five bullets. Ryan the Red Except Avenger. For my parents. And, Ju- <laughs> and Judith and the Ladies of Justice. Yeah, but my mom's getting it. Yeah. <laughs> five. Five. Where was I? DJ Sammy G? Five. Benny and Dana Tiberius? Five. Eric and Catherine from Yon Window Breaks? Five. Professor and Lady X? Five. Lavender's green, Dylan, Dylan. Lavender's blue. Lavender's green, Dylan, Dylan. I love you, for you too. No, no constrictor? Five. Bear cheap? Five. The fair and fragrant maiden, Chloe? Five. Anthony, who's cold and hates life, liberty, and the pursuit of cheese and S- brick uh, red. Six. <laughs> six. Wow. Yeah. Well, he does hate cheese. Uh, listen, we should take a little break to say how someone could become part of this list and be told that we think they should have five bullets <laughs> put in them. <laughs> Go to patreon.com forward slash the booking where you can sign up for any reward level. Uh, $10 gets you a donor shout out. $5 gets you Boy, access it. to behind the scenes content, mm-hmm. like all the fun things that we filmed today in our recording yep. session. And let's see, $25 a month gets you a t-shirt and... Everything above and the best and most popular level actually mm-hmm. uh, is our fifty dollar a month support level, which gets you the t shirt, the donor shout out, all the great behind the scenes content, and uh, signed, personalized, autographed copies of every book we do here on the book booking sent to you months in advance, so that you have time to read along with us as we go. Jake wrote. In your face, arms, or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, it was yeah. very profound and insightful. And I signed my name, yeah, which one good. day is going to be worth several dollars on eBay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, however much the book's worth. So we uh, <laughs> this might devalue it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Still, maybe we can get a couple bucks out of it. Uh, you just a Jeffrey the Texas Ranger. Five. Five. Yeah. Midnight Ninja Ellen. Five. Five. Return of the Jedediah. Five. Jay of Rack and Ruin. Five. Timothy the Rider at Dawn. Five. Eric and Kate the Camp Champ Kings who are warm and love bees. Zero. Because the world is capricious. Yep. Matty Matty Matt Man. Five. Sweet Jamie Sunshine. Five. Tyler the Keeper of Eternal Darkness and Laura the Keeper of Eternal Light. Sonk. Is that French for five? Yeah. Cold Steel Cody. Fint. Jacqueline the Librarian Barbarian. Cinco. <laughs> Bob, John Babadillo, Bomb Diggity, and Captain Tenniel, his mate. Uh, five. Saxophone Alex. V. 
The other saxophone, Alex, and dubstep Danny. Five. Uh, Ryan the Terror of Texas and Eric of the Cream and Crimson, who are no longer stuck in the cold. Please send cheese. Penta? Sure. Mm. Spencella and Kylo Ren? Five. John the Cosmic King of Chaos? Five. <laughs> Matthew the Mind Flayer? Five. Any are you okay? Get your gun. Five. Fight of the Valerie? Five. Thor Ragnar the Josh? One. Steven? <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Five. Peglodon? Five. Christopher the Flower Hulk? Five. Lady of the Crystal Lake? Five. Ian the Death of Mira and Lord of Death? Five. Emily Nightshade, the Haunter of Dreams. Five. All about the Benjamin, baby. Five. Mysterious Phantom, baby. Oh, a couple thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, the Dark Hooded Lord of Death. You. <laughs> Jeremy, the Dark Hooded Lord of Death, and the Brooding Bride, Maya! Maya! Uh, and Posey. Five. And Posey, and little baby Posey. Congratulations. Congratulations. Here's five bullets for your parents. <laughs> Life is absurd, isn't it? <laughs> Remains of the J. <laughs> Five. <laughs> Abram, the puller of teeth. Five. La Morte de Trenton. <laughs> Five. <laughs> that concludes donor shout outs. Man, you can really feel the inspiration behind Remains of the J, Abram, the puller of teeth, and La Morte de Trenton. I think they just keep getting better. <laughs> <laughs> they really do get better. I know. I love our patrons. I love this list. Thank you for supporting the show for so many years. Anything else to say, guys, about the absurdity of life or the absurdity of these two books and their stupid authors and their stupid points? I'm glad to be done with them. <laughs> glad to be done. Hey, Brandon, hey, how, amen. how many bullets out of five do you give to the stranger? Uh, is he promising to use them? Yes. Five. On you. Oh, okay. <laughs> five. <laughs> then. you won't have to read the book. Oh, yeah. Jake, how many bullets to the stranger? Five. How many war-torn uh, villas out of seven do you give to... Farewell to arms. Oh, man. I assume not zero. Three, four. Three. I was going to say three. Yeah. Three. Yeah. I will join you with three. I don't want to push it over into the slightly positive because I think this really is kind of a, just a not, it's not entertaining. It fails to it's see not us worth it. It's not worth it. There's lots of other Hemingway to read. Yeah. If you like this kind of thing, even you can find better, you find better war books. You can just find every better everything books. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for talking. Thank you, Brandon people. Brandon and Jake. Yeah, no B problem. Bye. Bye.